Good afternoon. It's February 13th. We're here for council session. We're starting shortly after 1.15 and we'll begin with a proclamation recognizing Teen Dating Violence Prevention Month by Councilmember Katz and the County Executive. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. We are here to raise awareness against teen dating violence. This month-long effort focuses on education to prevent teen dating abuse before it occurs. Teen dating violence is defined as the physical, sexual, psychological, or emotional violence within a dating relationship. This includes stalking and uh, can occur either in person, over the phone, or through the Internet. Approximately one in 10, one in 10 teens report being hit or otherwise physically hurt by a romantic partner within the last year. Additionally, one in 10 teens reports for sexual violence by someone they were dating within the last year. Teen dating violence can have a lasting impact on teens' life. Teens who experience dating violence are more likely to suffer from anxiety, depression, drug and alcohol abuse, and other unhealthy behaviors. If teens are experiencing dating violence, they should talk to a trusted adult or contact the Family Justice Center either by going to its website or heading directly to its offices in Rockville. On April 7th, the Choose Respect Montgomery, an initiative of the Montgomery County Domestic Violence Coordinating Council, will host Respect Fest, an annual festival to raise awareness about teen dating violence. This event will take place at the Wheaton Community Recreation Center from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Choose Respect's mission is to promote respect in dating relationships and to raise community awareness about the prevalence of teen dating violence. We urge all teens to attend this incredible annual event featuring free food, performances, a resource fair, and a great activities. Let's end teen dating violence. Mr. County Executive. Thank you. Um, it's important this month to recognize Teen Dating, Teen Violence Awareness Month, and because we know that domestic violence affects all people, it crosses over race, gender, age. It is not specific to any one group, and teen violence often is, can often be domestic violence. So it's not sep not necessarily separated to people that you're not related to. As a former teacher, I remember times when I noticed signs of unhealthy relationships or the impact of domestic violence among some of my students. So this is something I saw with elementary school kids. At the time, resources like the Family Resource Center did not exist, the Family Justice Center. Um, and many resources that are available now to help navigate the situation did not exist years ago. I'm grateful that the county has stepped forward with various resources that have continually supported um, youth in our community and others in our community. And I've been able to be supportive of this as both a council member and as county executive. And we've done a great deal to assist. The county can always do more. That's why we work with the Domestic Violence Coordinating Council and the Commission for Women. Um, they are definitely there to provide suggestions and advice for continuous improvement. And they deal with these issues every day firsthand, something that Sydney and I do not have to do. Um, from their recommendations, we developed an annual video contest. And I've seen some of the videos. They can be pretty intense and pretty amazing at the same time. And participation in 2023, there were 283 entries from 478 students representing 60 schools. Uh, we've expanded presentations at local schools. They developed programs for athletes and youth organizations and created an annual event, Respect Fest, to encourage education and peer support. Our goal continues to be ensuring easy and reliable access to domestic violence services. So you can call the Montgomery County Crisis Hotline. And the phone number is 240-777-4000. And you can also call. I have the second number here. You could also call the Montgomery County Victim Assistance and Sexual Assault Crisis Line at 
4357. I, like everybody else here, is committed to continuing to do this work. It is some of the most important work we do. And victims of, you know, young vi violence at a young age, teenager, younger, um, they often carry those scars and those burdens throughout the rest of their life. So it can be very impactful and long-term, in fact, impactful on the lives of the people who experience it. So th thank you for letting me join you today. Thank you. I'm going to ask the crowd behind me to please introduce themselves. Smith Varia, Program Manager for the Family Justice Center with the Sheriff's Office. Tom Mannion, Director of the Family Justice Center with the Sheriff's Office. Sheriff Maxwell Wee. Lieutenant Dave Cohen, County Police Special Victims Investigations. Tanya Leo Royster, Commission for Women, and this is Rome. John McCarthy, State's Attorney. Thank you very much. Many of you know that many years we've had Debbie Feinstein, who works for the State's Attorney's Office, uh, receive this proclamation. However, she's busy in Annapolis today, so playing the part of Debbie Feinstein will be Tom Mannion from the uh, uh, Family Justice Center. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and uh, thank you, Councilmember Katz uh, and our County Executive for uh, helping us to recognize February as uh, Teen Dating Violence Awareness and Prevention Month. Um, I hope that uh, you will all uh, uh, join us on uh, April 1st for two weeks of virtual events for Respect Fest. Uh, there's also an in-person festival on Sunday, April 7th at the Wheaton Community Recreation Center. Um, I also, in addition to being the director of our Family Justice Center, uh, have the privilege of being the chair of our Domestic Violence Coordinating Council, the current chair. Um, Choose Respect and Respect Fest is an event and an initiative that I've been working on for close to 10 years now. Um, in various capacities, and it's been incredible to see it grow from, you know, reaching a few hundred people to reaching a few thousand people. We reach thousands of uh, teens in middle and high school every year to talk about healthy versus unhealthy relationships, um, signs of toxic relationships, how to help a friend, where to get help. Um, and it's just been an incredible initiative to see uh, flourish and grow, and I hope you'll all join us um, for those first two weeks in April for virtual events. Um, and then again, April 7th is our in-person Festival Respect Fest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. County Executive, if you'll please join me if I can put this in there. There we go. Great. Yeah. Let's let go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We have a proclamation. Whereas teen dating violence occurs within dating relationships, when one partner seeks to gain power and control over another person, and includes any of these types of abuses, physical, sexual, psychological, emotional, financial, stalking, and technological abuse, and... Whereas one in three teens in the United States will experience physical, sexual, or emotional abuse from someone they're in a relationship before they become adults, one in 10 Maryland high school students report experiencing physical violence in a dating relationship, and one in 10 report experiencing sexual violence in a dating relationship, and? Whereas February is Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month and provides an opportunity for our community to acknowledge the prevalence of teen dating violence and to promote education about this issue for our residents and, you want to finish it all up? Finish it all, okay. Whereas Choose Respect Montgomery, a prevention initiative of the Montgomery County Domestic Violence Coordinating Council offers a public service announcement video competition, programs for teens, educational programs and videos, and a community-wide virtual festival, Respect Fest, from April 1st to April 14th, 2024, an in-person program on April 7th, 2024. Choose Respect is supported by the Montgomery County Family Justice Center Foundation, Montgomery County Public Schools, and many partner agencies who offer services and support for teens. And whereas together we can reduce dating violence in Montgomery County through public awareness, now there be it resolved that the County Executive, Public Safety Chair, Council Member Sidney Katz and the entire County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby proclaim February 2024 as Teen Dating Violence Prevention Month in Montgomery County. We ask our community to recognize the pervasive problem of teen dating violence, to engage in education and prevention efforts, to support our friends and families in the process of seeking service, 
and to spread the word about the help available through the Family Justice Center presented this day, 13th of February, 2024. Presented to we're going to present to him. You know, my colleague in this room is Okay, colleagues, we will now move into general business. Madam Clerk, are there any announcements? Thank you, Mr. President. The public hearing for Bill 224, Traffic Stops, Consent Search of Motor Vehicle and Data Collection, has been moved from 1.30 p.m. to 7 o'clock p.m. on February 27th, 2024, at the Council Hearing Room, here in this room in the Council Office Building. Those wishing to register to speak may do so on the Council's website, as well as submit written and video testimony. Also, an item was added to today's agenda, item 16, the consent calendar, item H has been added. That is action on a resolution to appoint the county executive's nominee for Chief of Public Health Services in the Department of Health and Human Services, Dr. Nina Ashford. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just want to note that Councilmember Jawando is participating virtually today. Um, and I believe he is on the Zoom. And uh, Councilmember yeah, Sales uh, is yeah, at the, the National Association of Counties is not participating today. Um, the minutes from the January 30th, 2024 council meeting have been circulated. Are there any objections to approving these minutes? Seeing none from colleagues, these minutes are now approved. I want to thank everybody who is here for this afternoon's public hearing, and I'm talking slowly since we can't legally start public hearings until 1.30, the time at which we have posted them. In this rare moment, we are running about a minute and 30 seconds early, and so we'll just wait here for a few minutes, but I know we have uh, Mayor Monique Ashton and Mayor uh, and Mayor Judd Ashman here uh, from the city of, uh, did I mix that up? Ashton and Ashman. I got to say, if you say it fast, it's very challenging, but two, two great friends and uh, uh, great municipal leaders, and we're pleased to have you join us. And by both mixing up your names and saying nice things about you, we are now at 1.30. Uh, so the first is a public hearing on Supplemental Appropriation 2450 to the FY24 Operating Budget Montgomery County Government Non-Departmental Account Payment to Municipalities Gaithersburg and Rockville. Patrol officer costs in the amount of $1,076,584. The source of funds is General Fund Undesignated Reserves, a joint public safety and government operations and fiscal policy committee work session is scheduled for February 14th, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so by the close of business today. We have our two mayors here. Please join us at the table, Mayor Ashton, Mayor Ashman. Uh, you each have three minutes to speak. We will start with our host mayor from the uh, great city of Rockville. I'm gonna say they're both great cities, so they're, I'll allow you to say which is the greater uh, of the cities. But with that, uh, Madam Mayor, you have three minutes. Thank you. We, they were they are referring to us as the Ash Twins these days. Ah, <laughs> that's easier to say, I might use that. Cities in yes. an amazing county, how about that? Yes, yes. 
Good afternoon, President Friedson and County Council members. I'm Monique Ashen, Mayor of Rockville, and on behalf of the Rockville Mayor and Council, I want to provide support and support the Supplemental Appropriation 2450 on the county's FY24 operating budget. We are extremely grateful to the county executive as well as staff and the county council for your collaboration with Rockville and Gaithersburg. This is an essential public safety issue for us, not just a funding issue. Mayor and council strongly supports this appropriation. We understand and we want to be good partners that staff shortages are affecting public safety in the county. This is a serious issue for all of us and that there's been a need to redeploy six Montgomery County police officers out of each of our jurisdictions. This is important because it has significantly impacted our community. Overtime has been needed for our existing officers to cover the calls for service and support public safety in our city. Prior to the county's deployment shift, there was an agreement that Rockville police respond to 70% of the call and county will respond to 30% of the calls. We were informed in September of the need for this change and the shift was to begin November 1st, 2023. However, in actuality, we know from the data that it started earlier. By October, we were already responding to 84% of calls. The 43% increase in workload has stressed our Rockville City Police staffing resources and response time and also puts a strain on their families and our community. The supplemental funding is needed urgently to support community policing and safety in Rockville. We are team players and we understand the county's need for support. We are willing to help. To avoid impacting public safety, county resources are urgently needed to help support six officers and address the overtime stress of our staff. Non-emergency calls have been delayed due to a lack of staff capacity and our overtime bills are higher. The additional county funding will enable Rockville City Police to be more responsive to calls for service and better protect our community. I will say in the county staff will also benefit because you are in our city. So, this will benefit all of us. Please move forward on the prorated support for Rockville and Gaithersburg. The city requested a full year of funding also be included in Rockville's municipal tax duplication payment in FY25. So we're also looking ahead to that. Rockville stands ready to partner with you on the permanent solution that will enable the Rockville City Police Department to continue to provide excellent crime prevention and public safety protection for our community. In closing, thank you for this opportunity, and we ask for a favorable vote on Supplemental Appropriation 2450. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Mayor, you have three minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, first off, Mr. President, Madam Vice President, members of the Council, friends, um, I stand, I echo basically everything that my fellow Ash Twin from <laughs> Rockville uh, said, and I will just, I won't belabor all of the points. I will just um, go a little further to thank in specifically uh, Chief Jones, uh, members of the Montgomery County Police Department, County Executive Elrich, um, and his leadership team for working with out both of our staffs um, and our, our police teams to come up with these numbers and, and, and negotiate um, a bill that goes a long way to addressing the funding gap that's created by this change in service in the current budget year. And we look forward to working with all of you uh, on fiscal year 25 funding and beyond to ensure that we continue to provide strong and effective public safety services in Gaithersburg and Rockville and the county. So thank you all very much. Thank you to both of you. I uh, want to acknowledge and, and thank your public safety teams and really appreciate the collaboration with our police department and your Municipal Police Departments, obviously this body has spent a lot of time and energy and effort to uh, handle municipal tax duplication and appreciate both of your leadership and all the other collaboration and support that you've uh, done. Not exactly the same issue, but part of the same broader set of issues and challenges and shows how we can work together as municipal and county government to serve our residents and nothing more important than public safety. So thank you for your service and this public hearing is now closed. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on to item two. This is a public hearing on the 2024-2030 Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Service Master Plan. Council action is scheduled for February 27th, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so by the close of business on February 20th, 2024. There are no speakers signed up for this hearing, so this
public hearing is now closed. We'll move on to item three. This is a public hearing on Supplemental Appropriation 2456 to the FY24 Operating Budget, Montgomery County Government, Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Service, HVAC replacement, fire stations, in the amount of $397,000. The source of funds is general obligation bonds. A public safety committee work session is scheduled for March 18, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the council's Consideration should do so by the close of business on March 11, 2024. There are no speakers signed up for this hearing, and so this public hearing is now closed. We're going to move on to item four on our agenda. This is a public hearing on Supplemental Appropriation 2443 to the FY24 Operating Budget, Montgomery County Government, Department of Environmental Protection, Implementation of Bill 1822, Noise Control, Leaf Removal Equipment Amendments in the amount of $295,000. The source of funds is General Funds Undesignated Reserves. A Joint Transportation Environment and Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee work session is scheduled for February 22nd, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the Council's consideration should do so by the close of business on February 15th, 2024. There are no speakers signed up for this hearing, so that public hearing is now closed. Item number five on our agenda is a public hearing on Supplemental Appropriation 2438 to the FY24 Operating Budget, Montgomery County Government, Department of Transportation, Accelerating Innovative Mobility Challenge Grant in the amount of $581,165. The source of funds is a federal grant, Accelerating Innovative Mobility AIM Challenge, and $468,820 in mass transit undesignated reserves in the amount of $112,345. A Joint Transportation, Environment, and Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee work session is scheduled for February 22nd, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the Council's consideration should do so by the close of business on February 15th, 2024. There are no speakers signed up for this hearing, and so this public hearing is now closed. Item number six on our agenda, this is a public hearing on amendment to the FY23-28 to Capital Improvements Program and Supplemental Appropriation 2454 to the FY24 Capital Budget, Montgomery County Government, Department of Transportation, Bethesda Parking Security Camera Surveillance System in the amount of $2,008,000, source of funds, current revenue, general fund. The Joint Transportation Environment and Government Operations Fiscal Policy Committee work session is scheduled for February 22nd, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the Council's consideration should do so by the close of business on February 15th, 2024. There are no speakers signed up for this hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. Item number seven on our agenda. This is a public hearing on an amendment to the FY23-28 to Capital Improvements Program and Supplemental Appropriations 2458 to the FY24 Capital Budget, Montgomery County Government, Department of Transportation, Silver Spring Parking Security Camera Surveillance System in the amount of $2,418,000. The source of funds is Current Revenue General Fund, a Joint Transportation Environment Committee and Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee. Work session is scheduled for February 22nd, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the Council's consideration should do so by the close of business on February 15th, 2024. There are no speakers scheduled for this hearing. This public hearing is now closed. Item number eight on our agenda. This is a public hearing on an amendment to the FY23 to 28 Capital Improvements Program, Supplemental Appropriation 2457 to the FY24 Capital Budget, Montgomery County Government, Department of Transportation, Wheaton Parking Security Camera Surveillance System. This is in the amount of $339,000, and the source of funds is also source of funds current revenue general fund. A Joint Transportation Environment and Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee work session is also scheduled for, F, uh, for February 22nd, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the Council's consideration should do so by the close of business on February 15th, 2024. There are also no speakers signed up for this hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. Item number nine, this is a public hearing on amendment to the FY23 to 28 Capital Improvements Program, Supplemental Appropriation 2459 to the FY24 Capital Budget, Montgomery County Government, Department of Transportation, Ride On Bus Fleet in the amount of uh, $46,024,000, source of funds, current revenue, mass transit, uh, $42,024,000 uh, federal aid, $3.2 million state aid, $800,000. A Joint Transportation and Environment and Government Operations and uh, 
Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee work session is scheduled for February 22nd, 2024. I'll just note, I think there might have been, no, I think that was right. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so by the close of business on February 15th, 2024. There are no speakers signed up for this hearing. This public hearing is now closed. Item number 10, this is a public hearing on an amendment to the FY23 to 28 Capital Improvement Program and Supplemental Appropriation 2453 to the FY24 Capital Budget, Montgomery County Government, Department of Public Libraries, Clarksburg Library, in the amount of 6830000 source of funds, general obligation bonds. An Education and Culture Committee work session is scheduled for March 7th, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the Council's consideration should do so by the close of business on February 29th. 2024. We have two speakers currently signed up, uh, starting with Jasheen Kaur and Adrian Elephantis. If you could join us if you're here at the table. And we'll start with Jasheen. If you could just hit your button there in front of you. Perfect. You have three minutes. Good afternoon. I'm Jasheen Kaur, a student at Clarksburg High School and a frequent visitor of the Germantown Library. The Germantown Library has provided me with a plethora of benefits such as educational resources, a focused learning environment, and proper research facilities. I'm all for the Clarksburg Library being built. However, I hold reservations about the environmental stewardship of its landscaping process. Speaking on behalf of the environmental organization, Lawns MD, it is a goal of ours to push forward alternatives to turf grass in public and private properties. Recent studies have proven turf grass maintenance is a large inducer of pollution and loss of biodiversity. Looking at the public libraries in Maryland, we see a common occurrence of turf grass in its base layers and surroundings. These public lawns are subject to regular mowing cycles using gas-powered lawnmowers. In an hour, gas-powered lawnmowers exert the same pollutants as a car driven 100 miles. Aside from this, traditional turf grass lawns also demand extensive care using fertilizers and pesticides. These all pose a threat to both human health as well as the environment. Embracing different alternatives, however, allows for a variety of ecological benefits. Implementing native plants, for example, provides a crucial habitat opportunity for pollinators and improves biodiversity. An idea Lawns MD has been working to push forward is clover lawns. Clovers remove the need for fertilizers due to their nitrogen fixing abilities, increase erosion control, and minimize mowing patterns significantly. Discussing the monetary impact for turf grass is economically burdensome when compared to clovers. A single dollar can cover up to 1,000 square feet of clovers, making this inexpensive idea truly adaptable in our community. As stewards of our city's future, it is crucial that we push forward an agenda of sustainable urban development. By administering alternatives to default turf grass lawn, the Clarksburg Library can lead by example and inspire other communities to follow suit. It's time to break away from the stereotype of a classic doll cookie cut American lawn and move towards a more sustainable and green future. I truly hope these environmental suggestions can be used towards the landscape development and designing process for the Clarksburg Public Library. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us and for your advocacy. Now, uh, Adrian Alafontis, you have three minutes. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adrienne Elefantis, and I'm here today on behalf of the Board of Directors for the Clarksburg Homeowners Association, which is the HOA for Clarksburg Town Center. I'm here to voice our concerns about the Clarksburg Library budget request being considered today. This $6.8 million request would move the library out of Town Center or open the door to that possibility with no, um, no compelling justification and no sign that anyone is considering how significant a change this is and its impact on the surrounding community. As you know, there is an existing parcel for the library um, in Town Center, it's at Clarksburg Square Road and um, Public House Road. The county owns that lot and could break ground tomorrow. We recommend the county proceed with building the library there. And first, let me give me a little background, let me give you a little background about our board. The five of us are all longtime residents of Town Center. Most of us have resided here since the early 2000s. We, uh, most of us have school-aged children. We've been serving together for several years now with the exception of one who just joined. 
Um, we have a pretty good read on what matters to residents because we get to hear their questions and complaints all the time. One thing everyone wants to see is our neighborhood completed with all the originally planned am amenities intact, and that would include, among other things, having a public library right in town. Let me explain the two main problems we see with the county executive's request. One issue is the timeline. The supplemental budget request doesn't say anything about delaying the library, but we don't see how it won't delay it significantly. Conducting a, new, a whole new site evaluation will take time and brings with it a bunch of new unknowns. We needed a library in Clarksburg like yesterday. We needed it five years ago. There are 30,000 people in Clarksburg now, and that number will be 40,000 in just a couple of years. We've built four new elementary schools, one new middle school, a grocery store, restaurants, gas stations, a drug store, and outlets during the past 20, 20, 20 to 25 years, but no public library, which frankly seems really out of step. 30,000 people should not have to get in a car and drive to Germantown or Damascus to check out a library book. The area needs its library now, so let's use the parcel we have. Uh, this is the fastest, easiest, and cheapest way forward. Secondly, let's remember that the original choice to put the library in town center was not coincidental. This was part of a larger vision for town center serving as a hub for all of Clarksburg. The idea was to draw in people from the surrounding area by providing a public space and a civic component, such as a library. We need to be careful about unraveling the threads of plans that were years in the making. Without the library, town center is just another bedroom community. And that's not in keeping with Clarksburg's master plan. It doesn't matter that the library might be built uh, half a mile away within eyesight of the original site. Um, town center will not be the same vibrant, functional place it was meant to be. For a lot of us, this is going to for a lot of us, this is going to feel like a major bait and switch. One last point I'd like to make is about the alternate like alternate location at 355 in Stringtown. This is not what I or anyone would consider a pedestrian-friendly part of Clarksburg. There's a, this is a major intersection with a lot of traffic. It doesn't make sense to put a library there, not when the other choice is to put it in a safe, walkable community right across from a brand new retail center next to a green space and amphitheater and around the corner from the beautiful King's Local Park and Playground. I invite you to drive up to Clarksburg and see these areas in person so you can make the comparison for yourself. Ms. Alphonse, I'm sorry, you're over your three minutes. Okay, if you could thanks. wrap up. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you for coming in to testify. All right. We have no other uh, speakers for this public hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. Appreciate both of you for joining us today. Thank you. Item number 11 on our agenda. This is a public hearing on the declaration of no further need disposition of a portion of Liberty Mill Road located in Germantown, Maryland to Kingsview Station Joint Venture. Council action is scheduled for February 27, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so by the close of business on February 20th, 2024. There are no speakers signed up for this hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. We will now move on to item number 12 for the introduction of bills. This is a legisla uh, legis legislative session day number four for the year. The first bill for introduction is Bill 324, Late Night Establishments, Hours of Operations. The lead sponsors are Council Vice President Stewart, Council Member Albernaz, and Council Member Glass. Co-sponsors, Council Member Lukey, Council Member Katz, Council Member Fanny Gonzalez, Council Member Balcom, and Council President Friedson, myself. A public hearing is scheduled for March 5th, 2024 at 1.30. Uh, let me turn it over to the sponsors, starting with Council Vice President Stewart. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, I want to thank uh, our, the co-leads on this, Councilmember Alvarez and Glass, and um, thank all the co-sponsors of this legislation, and Ms. McCartney Green for her excellent work on this. Um, we're putting this bill out there to align the hours of operation for our late night clubs, bars, night spots, such as our hookah lounges, smoke shops, and vape shops. Right now in the county, uh, late night places that serve alcohol must close at 2 a.m. during the week and 3 a.m. on weekends. Other places that provide tobacco products such as hookah are able to operate all night. Regionally, there have been some changes lately. Um, in Washington, D.C., lounges that provide hookah must close at the same time as other establishments. And Prince George's Council uh, last March unanimously passed legislation which closed these lounges at 8 p.m. and require them to only be in light industrial areas. 
This bill is, enti is intended to align our late night business hours of operation and ensure that people who live and come to our county can enjoy themselves and get home safely. As noted in the packet, there have been uh, there has been a number of an increase in the calls for service, uh, particularly from 2 a.m. to 7 a.m., which has resulted in a drastic increase in the need for police presence in our central business districts at this time and excess overtime expenses, expenditures in Montgomery County. Um, we also heard today from the mayors of Rockville and Gaithersburg about the impact of our staffing resources and reassignment of officers are having across the county. These issue, the issues we are seeing are having a negative impact on our businesses, um, our residents, and increasing our police interactions in our downtown areas. Our, again, our intent is to, sure that, and to, is to ensure that everyone who comes to our downtown areas to enjoy themselves can do so safely and get home safely, and that our other businesses that are there and the residents who live there can also enjoy the community. Thank you. Thank you. Let me turn it over to the other uh, co-leads, uh, Councilmember Albernaz and then Councilmember Glass. Councilmember Albernaz. Thank you much, Mr. President. I really want to uh, express my appreciation to Council Vice President Stewart, um, who has done an outstanding job representing this district, and before that, as mayor of a municipality that was also impacted um, by what was happening in downtown Silver Spring. So, uh, like all of us running for office a couple of years ago, I knocked on a lot of doors in this community. And consistently and without fail, the number one issue that came up were concerns around crime, and particularly concerns around crime that was occurring in the very early morning hours. Residents who had lived in this community for years, even decades, no longer felt safe. Uh, and it was clear that we needed to take action. And so I appreciated the efforts of my colleagues to uh, work with our hookah lounges and some of our other um, nighttime establishments in downtown Silver Spring to establish legislation that last year uh, to require that there be a security plan in place uh, some, and some reasonable and thoughtful interim steps. But it's clear that that has not gone far enough. And I think it is more than appropriate for us to take what I think is very reasonable action um, to ensure the safety and security of all of our residents. Uh, this is something that they have been repeatedly asking for and something that I'm happy we are about to take action on soon. So with that, I yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Glass. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, 11 years ago, then County Executive Ike Leggett uh, appointed me to serve on the Nightlife Economy Task Force. And one of the recommendations of that task force was to extend hours of operation for businesses with liquor licenses. Uh, it was originally 1 a.m. during the weekday and 2 a.m. on weekends, but we wanted to make sure that people could enjoy themselves safely in our communities and our burgeoning nightlife hubs, and so we extended them by one hour. Eleven years later, some people think it might be flourishing a bit too much, uh, but the reality is Councilmember Stewart and I last year held a safety summit in downtown Silver Spring, uh, and we heard people's concerns. And this legislation turns those concerns uh, into action. Uh, and what it does is it fairly applies these same rules for businesses with liquor licenses to other businesses in the area, particularly tobacco-related businesses. Uh, the intention is simply for people to enjoy themselves in a safe environment. And so I appreciate working with Vice President Stewart and Councilmember Albernaz and I had discussions about this uh, before this council and appreciate all of our colleagues who have signed on as co-sponsors. We can encourage nightlife, we can make the community safer, and that's what this legislation is intended to do. Thank you. Thank you to all of the co-lead sponsors on this uh, important public safety initiative. Uh, anything from council staff, Ms. Picard Gary? I do want to note that the packet does not have um, Council Vice President Friesen as a co-sponsor. Council President Friesen as a uh, co-sponsor, but that will be added for future packets. Just another demonstration that this is not a position that rules by edict, <laughs> contrary to uh, uh, no opinion at all, actually. Uh, thank you for, for noting that. I, I appreciate that. Uh, okay, th that bill is now introduced. 
The next bill for introduction is Bill 424, Community Reinvest Reinvestment and Repair Fund Commission Established. Lead sponsors, Councilmember Mink, Sales, and Jawando. Co-sponsors, myself, Council President Friedson, Councilmember Katz, Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez, Councilmember Albernaz, and Council Vice President Stewart. A public hearing is scheduled for March 5th, 2024 at 1.30. Let me turn it over to lead sponsor, Councilmember Mink. Thanks very much. Um, I want to thank uh, Council Members Jawando and Sales for introducing this legislation with me. Council President Friedson, Council Vice President Stewart, and Council Members Katz, Fanny Gonzalez, and Alpernos for co sponsoring. Um, Ken Hartman and Earl Stoddard with the County Executive's Office for their help. Tiffany Ward with the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice. And Raphael Murphy with the Office of Grants Management for their help. And most of all, the community members and advocacy groups, including Racial Justice Now, ACLU of Maryland, and leaders of a beautiful struggle for their hard work on this, first at the state and now at the local level. When we scratch below the surface of the so-called war on drugs, we find it was primarily a war on drug users and their families and communities. In a 1994 interview, Nixon Administration Domestic Affairs Advisor John Ehrlichman admitted that the drug war was intentionally designed as a political tool to target critics of the administration in both the anti-war movement and the African American community. As with alcohol prohibition, it became clear that a violent and carceral position, a posture towards public health issues not only failed to reduce violence, harm, and illicit activity, it actually exacerbated harm and drove social instability and violence both locally and on a global scale. I am proud that Maryland voters overwhelmingly chose to change course with the 2022 Recreational Adult Use Constitutional Amendment, which legalized the purchase and possession of cannabis for personal adult use. We know that the vast majority of adult drug consumers who utilize substances like cannabis do so without incident. For those who utilize substances in a dangerous manner, we must be prepared to offer an appropriate public health response. We know that fear of incarceration is not an effective or appropriate tool for helping those struggling with addiction. As policymakers, one of the most difficult tasks for us can be recognizing the harm of past policies acknowledging that harm and repairing the harm amongst those impacted by our decisions. This legislation is an opportunity to do that. The Recreational Adult Use Constitutional Amendment in Maryland created new markets for economic opportunity to flourish. But we must recognize that it also highlighted an inequity, that many people, disproportionately white people, will profit immensely from a new commodity that was just a few months ago contraband funneling disproportionately black and brown people into the criminal justice system, again, as a result of a policy explicitly designed to do that. State legislators, working closely with advocates, wisely created a fund, the state's Community Reinvestment and Repair Fund, which will hold 35% of revenues from the new recreational cannabis excise tax. Those funds are to be split amongst Maryland jurisdictions, proportionate to the rate at which their residents faced prosecution for cannabis possession charges. Each county is then responsible for distributing those funds to community-based organizations serving communities most impacted by the disproportionate enforcement of the cannabis prohibition. So this legislation today, establishing the Community Reinvestment and Repair Fund Commission here in Montgomery County, will allow us to begin drawing what currently looks to be approximately $1 million a year from the state's fund and begin getting that funding to our community-based nonprofits. With this commission, we have an opportunity to ensure that impacted communities have a public and participatory leading role in deciding where this funding should land. As we begin seeking to pay reparations and move forward together towards a more just future, I look forward to the continuing discussion with the community and with colleagues and taking action on this important legislation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Councilmember Juwanda. Thank you very much and really appreciate uh, working with Councilmember Mink uh, and all of her team and the community and Councilmember Sales uh, in introducing uh, this really important legislation, uh, which builds upon and is an outgrowth of state legislation and, uh, as was mentioned, the voters' uh, decision to legalize cannabis for personal adult use. Um, 
the mens- the comments about the failed drug war are certainly on point. Uh, I also think it's important to to mention that just uh, a few weeks ago, uh, the FDA, which we are home to here in the Montgomery County, uh, recommended uh, lowering uh, the classification of marijuana and cannabis uh, as far as where it is on the drug scale. Uh, another big step uh, in the repair work that needs to be done. Uh, I've mentioned before in, in the context of some of our other work that we've done on the council and, um, and in the state, uh, that Maryland uh, incarcerates more young black men ages 18 uh, to 24 than any other state, um, many of whom have been incarcerated over the years uh, and are still incarcerated uh, due to low-level drug possession and use. Uh, this policy was designed to disproportionately attack certain communities. Um, and this repair fund, while not going to solve all of that, Uh, is a step in the right direction. So I'm really hopeful that the commission that will be created by this bill will thoughtfully advise us, the county, uh, about community uses of these funds that come from now the legal uh, sale of cannabis uh, and look forward to working with all of my colleagues to pass the bill and with the commission once it's set up and running. Uh, Again, thank you, Councilmember Mink and your team and to Ms. Wellens, Christine Wellens, our attorney, for all her work in drafting the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Glass is requested to speak. I'd like to be listed as a co-sponsor. Thank you. I don't see any other colleagues wishing to speak. Anything to add here from Ms. Wellens, Council Attorney? Nothing to add, thank you. Okay, all right. With that, uh, this bill is introduced. So we are going to uh, move on to our next item, uh, item 13. Uh, It's a call of final reading for expedited bill 3823, tenant displacement, right of first refusal to buy rental housing amendments. The Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee recommends enactment with amendments. Uh, There are a number of amendments and a a few clarifications that uh, are uh, Council Attorney, Ms. McCartney-Green will, will uh, share with us, um, and uh, we can uh, walk through the, uh, uh, the item here, but um, you know, ultimately this was introduced. Uh, we went through committee, had a number of committee sessions in December and, uh, and, and recently within the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, this bill would amend sections 53A2, 53A4 of the Montgomery County Code to authorize the county executive to designate a qualified entity that may exercise the right of first refusal. Uh, just a quick summary. Uh, the uh, discussion points uh, requiring DHCA to send a statement of interest uh, uh, within 10 days, 10 business days, 10 working business days after the receipt of a complete right of first refusal. Uh, that was approved two to one. Council Member Jawando abstained on that item. Require DHCA to receive and transmit the offers to each qualified entity rather than the owner sending a copy to the offer. Essentially, the executive branch decides who the qualified entities are. It should be their responsibility since they're updating it regularly to uh, communicate with, uh, with those. The uh, property owner would send it to the county and then the county would, di- would distribute it. Require the department to receive an offer electronically unless by doing so would cause undue burden then the department may, at the discretion of the director, provide alternative reasonable methods for receipt. So trying to reduce the amount of paper, also make it more practical and realistic to receive an offer and distribute it out uh, for the department. Uh, Remove religious and charitable rental housing exemption. Strike method three approval for regulations to establish a criteria for qualified entities and replace it with method two approval. This was something that the executive branch had agreed Uh, with uh, council staff and and ultimately uh, with the committee to give the council uh, more of a role uh, uh, in this. Uh, Include assignments for governmental housing authorities. We just heard from our municipal partners. We we heard from them during the process and uh, expanded the uh, potential assignments. Uh, And then several technical and clarifying amendments that were proposed by DHCA. This is listed out in page seven of the staff report uh, dated uh, January 22nd. 
Uh, and uh, I'll just note uh, several of those were issues that had been received from stakeholders that the department had agreed upon uh, that were discussion points that were outstanding from our prior uh, committee work session uh, that were worked out, and so they weren't much of dis discussion points because they were uh, based on, on consensus, uh, and several were just technical, you know, very minor uh, ones uh, as, uh, as well. Um, there was a fiscal impact statement, uh, a uh, racial equity statement. Uh, I'll let council staff uh, go through uh, those issues in a, a climate assessment. Um, but with that, uh, we also had an outstanding amendment uh, that was before us, a request from affordable housing providers that the department had essentially agreed upon, but that we didn't have the language before us and so didn't want to approve, but you know, essentially approved in uh, principle. And then there was uh, you know, a couple other outstanding items that I'll allow uh, council staff to expound upon. So uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Ms. McCartney-Green with appreciation. This is a complicated bill that started with uh, something that I had been talking about for several years about uh, how backwards our scenario was in affordable housing where we were hoarding tens of millions of dollars in affordable housing money to essentially hold for what could be 24 hours or a very short period of time a very expensive property could be to the tune of 70 plus million dollars as a recent example would uh, would indicate, and that was preventing us from actually doing the type of long-term financing and acquisition and preservation uh, that we, we could be doing. Uh, it expanded from there fairly significantly, I, you know, but, but that's originally what uh, this uh, uh, was, was focused on. That's a very important element uh, of this that I just wanted to note for, for colleagues. So with that, let me turn it over to Ms. McCartney-Green. You can walk us through uh, any additional items that I missed, and then uh, we can go through some of the uh, clarifications and outstanding items that still have to be uh, resolved. So with that, let me turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Council uh, President. That was very thorough. Um, still a complicated issue, and so if I say things too fastly or if there's certain things to clarify, I just ask that you just stop me so that I can uh, make sure it's clear on um, presentation. Um, the fiscal impact statement that was provided um, so that this would not increase the county's revenue or expenditure um, with the with the including of the assignment. Uh, OLO's economic statement anticipates the bill would also have an insignificant um, direct impact on economic conditions. Uh, and the climate assessment was indeterminate and the racial equity and social impact statement anticipates legislation would have a positive impact on racial equity and social justice in the county um, as it codifies recognizing promising practice for preserving and creating affordable housing in the county law. Um, the way how the packet is actually established, it talks about three remaining issues that the PHP committee um, reserved for the full council. As mentioned, there were two work sessions, uh, where it was very thorough discussions, both on December 11th and January 22nd. Uh, the three remaining issues uh, concerned, uh, the first issue we're uh, providing, there was discussion about a statement of interest letter and uh, council uh, member Jawando wanted to provide, have additional information be provided at full council to determine whether or not that letter was sufficient or looking at the legality of the letter and some of the other specifics. The second one was the approval of the amendment proposed by MHA and HOC to exempt certain transactions for uh, LIHTC, which is the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, and then the tr transition language. I will ask that we start with the MHA amendment because I just feel like that's a, that's more easier and the uh, committee also was in general consensus to support that amendment. I'm just looking to see if I had HOC or anyone else here, but uh, it's <clears throat> pretty straightforward and complex at the same time. Currently, uh, the purpose of this amendment was that LIHTC would not fall, uh, fall under the requirements of ROFR. Uh, LIHTC is a federal program or federal resource that provides an equity financing tool that subsidizes the acquisition of uh, construction and rehabbing of affordable housing that includes for low and moderate income tenants. And so what this uh, would do, and I'm looking at page uh, 60, that's the actual amendment. It goes from 60 to page 63. Um, very lengthy, but also very comprehensive to explain that uh, these type of transactions where they're either going to be financed by LIHTC meaning there's a portion that is um, financed by it or that's going to be. The issue that, the reason why this was raised by MHA and HOC is that currently uh, they would be subject to the county's right of first refusal. 
um, and with speaking with uh, DHCA and also with um, HOC, the consensus was to draft this amendment and uh, to put it forward uh, for our review. Yeah, it just, be, sorry, go, excuse me. Go ahead, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's fine. I'm just trying to make sure I'm on the same page so that I can have everyone else follow along. Um, While you're looking, just uh, to clarify, the committee agreed with this. Uh, we didn't have the language, not all council members at the committee had the language in front of us at the time that we were making the decision. And so I thought it would be most prudent since we didn't have the language. A couple of us had seen it, but others had not. Uh, and so we agreed in principle without formally adopting it. So if, if unless there's any objection, I think the most appropriate thing to do would be to, uh, you know, to see if there's consensus to take up without objection and then it'll be as uh, as amended. Uh, okay, so I see thumbs up from the two committee members. That would be in the spirit. So it, it is now an amended, you know, without objection, we would take that uh, amendment as uh, introduced it's in the spirit of the committee discussion, but it is uh, an amended version just from a parliamentary procedure uh, perspective. So um, we've adopted that amendment and appreciate the collaboration that took place to, to, to move that forward. Go ahead and continue, thank you. And just for clarity for the other uh, council members, the purpose of the amendment is uh, the life check transfers uh, requiring the sellers and a notice to DHCA with the documentation to prove that the exemption is valid, that they're under these uh, type of restriction, and giving DHCA an opportunity to re review and approve. It also provides an exemption from the notice requirement for life check transfers where the property already has a regulatory agreement with the county. So if the county is already aware of these transactions happen, it also provides an exemption for that. I will say that uh, Director Bruton is very savvy and, and expert in this, and so if there are additional questions concerning how the transfer work, um, it might be helpful to have him or um, HOC also provide some background. With I th that, I, I think I think we're good on that. Okay. Unless there are any colleagues who have specific questions, I think. With that, we can move on to our uh, our first uh, discussion, and that's concerning the um, statement of interest. And so, also want to back up here that the purpose of the bill is to create another tool in the toolbox. Um, I'm sure I'm taking that from one of the council members here, but I'm not sure who. But <laughs> that, was me. that was a customer. <laughs> and, and so, the purpose of it was obviously right now under the law, the county can. Um, uh, you exercise this right for a rofer. It can um, refuse to exercise this right, or it can waive it and have an agreement not to convert. Bill 3823 would also expand it to be able to assign its right in creating a county assignee. Uh, while reviewing that and looking at that, uh, council staff looked at other jurisdictions um, that provide for this right, and Prince George's County was much of the discussion for the PHP committee to look at what they were doing there because they already have existing law that provides for an assignment of the right. Uh, while looking at that, the concern was that if there is now the option for an assignment, should there be a time frame implemented where the county must act um, and express its interest or whether or not it's interested in the role for offer? There was a lot of discussion with that. The PHP committee landed with uh, requiring within 10 days of receipt of a role for offer that the county must uh, issue a statement of interest. And I have that language here in your packet. Um, and so that would basically declare whether or not they're going to move forward, not waive it, or assign it. Uh, during that discussion, uh, we talked about whether that letter is binding or not binding. Um, looking at Prince George's County law, uh, it is a non-binding uh, letter. One of the things to also clarify, and I want to make sure I, I narrow it in on this point, Prince George's County requires seven days, what the PHP committee required within 10 days. And just to clarify, Prince George's County requires seven calendar days. Correct. What we are requiring is, is uh, business days. So it's not only more days, but it's also business days. So it's effectively two weeks versus one week, just to clarify. No, and that's an important clarification. And so <clears throat> with that, um, the one thing that was not considered at, at the PHP com um, committee, and I want to make sure it's clear here, is that uh, Prince George's County regulations require that within the seven uh, calendar days after they've issued a notice that they are um, won't exercise their rofer within 10 days they are also required to issue a certificate of compliance so just to back up it's the statement 
plus the certificate of compliance that solidifies that process that the county will no longer move forward. Also in Prince George's County, it doesn't have an order of priority. After the county says that they're done, they're done. Montgomery County, on the other hand, does have a certificate of compliance, but that's not required to be issued until closer to the sale um, transaction, and that needs to happen within 180 days. So a couple of distinctions here. We talk about calendar versus business days. We talk about a certificate of compliance. Under the law, it's when the county feels that it is satisfied with the requirements, it will issue the certificate of compliance. Um, and then one more thing is the priority. Montgomery County has a priority. The county, the county assignee, which will now be amended in this bill, and HOC have 60 days to exercise that, right? Um, a tenant association, if organized, has 45. I'm sorry, a tenant association, if, if organized 45, they, they're not organized within a certain time, and they are by a certain time, they have 90 days. I hope that's not, that's clarifying some, some uh, parts there. But the, the discussion here, and Councilmember Joano, this was brought back here because I, I know you had some questions about it. And so we have a recommendation from the uh, PHP committee with the, within 10 days. It does not specify right now whether it's binding or not binding, and that was a discussion that was brought up. So I'm going to stop there. I appreciate that. So I'm sure now colleagues are sufficiently confused. If you could put yourselves in the queue, and I will uh, call on you at the appropriate time. I'll just note that the, 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 the basis of the committee conversation was to try to balance those times where we want to exercise this as an effective tool to preserve affordable housing and the times in which we know we're not going to exercise this and not holding up and using what is a fairly dramatic government power to interfere in the private market. And that is a delicate balance to find the right place to land. I think the committee was trying, the majority of the committee at least was trying to find that right balance. I think Councilmember Jawanda was sensitive to the binding versus non-binding. I want to turn to him to speak for himself, but I just want to, we got into a lot of technicality here. I just want to kind of take a step back to understand the, the nature of the conversation, which was really, how do we find the appropriate balance from having an effective tool that is a really important way for us to address preservation of affordable housing and, and, and utilize it in a way that makes sense? Uh, and how do we not interfere in a transaction that really would have no likelihood uh, of ever being uh, exercised and ultimately would just hold up a transaction that could have an impact on the broader housing market for really no public, you know, discernible public benefit. Mm -hmm. Easier said than done, but that was the, the nature of the conversation. Let me turn it to Councilmember Jawanda who wanted to comment on this. Thank you. Um, appreciate the work, Ms. McCartney-Green, and the additional work with uh, staff. Uh, I think uh, the whole committee was trying to strike the right balance, not just the not just the majority. Uh, I offered, which hasn't been missioned, I offered a intermediate timeline of of 30 days uh, at the committee, which we we ended up not uh, not considering. Um, I also asked the I think very important question, which we didn't have the answer to at the time, but we have the answer to now, as if this is a binding period, if a uh, if, if this is a binding 10 day period. The answer is it is not. Um, and so uh, if the county uh, did not submit a statement, statement of interest within 10 days, for example, and the other thing that to consider here is we, you could talk to Mr. Bruton if, I don't know if he's in the, I think he's in the room. I know he's in the room actually, I saw a screenshot of him. But we consider more of these than Prince George's County does. The scale and scope of Prince George's County is not a, it's almost an apples to oranges comparison as far as uh, how many of these we consider in, in the in the capacity issue. Uh, but that being said, this would not be binding. And so any time in that 180 day period after the 10 days, if we if the county did not submit interest, it could under the law, even with this amendment. I don't think that's a good amendment because it doesn't really mean anything. It also we heard testimony from Director Bruton, who uh, I'm um, can speak for himself as well that this was a tight time window for them to turn around and make that full assessment. Um, and while no one intends um, to uh, drag this out, you want to be able to be sure whether you want to potentially exercise it, uh, the right of first refusal. 
The other thing that is was further found out that we didn't know at committee that we know now, there are three other entities uh, that can exercise a right of first refusal, regardless of what the county right is, uh, whether this non-binding comes into a place. HOC has a right and tenant organizations have a right, as was mentioned by Ms. McCartney Green. So I think for all of these reasons, uh, it, it, this amendment doesn't make much sense uh, because one, we have our director of DHCA saying that would be a really tight timeline for them to consider given the capacity and the staffing uh, that they have and the amount of projects that, that uh, come up in a given year um, and that it really actually isn't binding. And so we could be, we could be creating more confusion in the private sector uh, by putting this in uh, and I, I just don't think that's effective. So uh, that's why I didn't vote for it. I didn't have, I didn't think I, we had full information. We didn't have full information at the time. We have more information now. And I think with the answers that we've received, uh, I do not think 10 days makes sense or is reasonable given the, the workload and the amount of projects and the fact that several other entities have a right of first refusal even outside of the county uh, to exercise well after that time period. So. Uh, I won't. I, I would make a, a a motion to remove this uh, amendment uh, and to go back to the original language, knowing that our DHCA director, in good faith, uh, wants to get these notifications out as soon as possible if we want to move forward. So that would be my my motion. Okay, I see there are other people in the queue. I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I, I guess by that motion, I am thoroughly confused. I, what is binding and what is not binding is if the, if the county says that they don't want it, is that binding? What, what part is binding? And, and so right now, just for clarity, the law doesn't specify any letter right now. So what Councilmember Duando is probably looking for is to go back to the existing law where there's no letter that's required within the 60 days. What was adopted by the PHP committee was a statement of interest. We did not discuss whether or not it should be binding or not. So as of right now, what's been adopted, it is a non-binding letter that needs to be sent within 10 uh, business working days. I, I can understand if the, if, if the county or whatever entity wanted it, that they could say, look, we're interested in having this and we're not sure at this point, but we're interested. I could see where that, you could call that binding or not binding, but I could see where that would be an option. But if the county is not interested in it, then why hold out this private entity till for another 90 days or whatever, whatever the time frame is? And then what Council Member Jawando mentioned was these other agencies. If the county says, look, I, at the end of 60 days, you know, you know what, we looked at it, we're not going to buy this. Do the other agencies at that point have a right to come in and say, we'd like to hold this up? I mean, at some point, this is about fairness. How does that work? So my understanding is that the county holds that right until they have actually exercised, yes or no. And so uh, the priority works that they have the first bite at the apple. And that's, it's an option contract. And they have the first option at that point. Whether it's in the best interest to extend it for the whole 60 days, I'm, I'm not sure, right? This is preserving affordable housing, so I'm hoping that they're... But when would, like, HOC, is it is it parallel uh, efforts? How yes, does so that work? After So the, what the law provides is that after the county has exercised or not, then HOC would consider. So they could come back in at the end of... The county says, all right, you know, we're, we're really interested in this one. The, the HOC, and we see HOC sitting here, even though he grew a beard, we recognize him. But anyhow, um, uh, a, a HOC could come in and say, you know what, we've been thinking about it. It's been 60, 80, whatever days it's been. Let us take it. You can't do that. Is that what you're saying? Could you come Yeah, why don't we invite HOC and uh, Director Bruton up here, Mr. Silverman. Um, And, and just to be clear, we're legislating on this. So anything that you've just discussed, we have the power to reduce or extend the timelines that have been proposed. We have the power to make binding or not binding any uh, scenario here. We have 
full carte blanche, uh, essentially. State law provides us, you know, in this rare moment, with you know, fairly wide latitude in order to move forward. This is what is before us right now. I just want to be clear, but we do have the ability to change what is proposed, uh, you know, based on what colleagues, you know, the, the will of the body. We do have carte blanche, but we should always be fair. I, I think that's an important point. Uh, Director Bruton, do you want to respond to sure. Councilman uh, Katz? Hi, for the record, Scott Bruton, Director of the Department of Housing and Community Affairs. Um, I'll uh, first explain how, current, how it works under current law and then how it would work under the proposed amendment. Um, under current law, um, uh, from the date of the receipt of the right of first refusal notice, um, the Department of Housing, well, the county, and HOC and the tenants have a certain number of days to indicate whether they are uh, interested in exercising. Both the county and HOC have 60 days to review uh, the materials contained in the ROFR packet, due diligence information about uh, revenue and debts and expenses and things like that, um, and then to determine if we're going to assume the contract and put down the deposit. Uh, the deposit's usually within 5% of the purchase price. Um, and that is a commitment that uh, while it does not bind us to close eventually, um, it is something that the county has always followed through on and that we take very serious. We're going to put down the deposit, we're going to go through. And I believe HOC you know, considers that. In their, the their money's on the line. Yes, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, tenants they have, as uh, Ms. McCartney-Green mentioned, they have a two-tier deadline. They have to negotiate, I'm sorry, not negotiate. They have to uh, register as a tenant association that is interested in exercising their rights, and they have 45 days to do that. And that can be a complicated process for them because they may have to gather hundreds of thousands of signatures to do that. Um, and then if they do that within 45 days, then they have an additional 45 days to put down the deposit. Um, and for all of those, um, if the county, HOC, and the tenants do not um, register their interest and put down the deposit, then, or just even register as a tenants association, then the sale can go forward. And so the if the tenants don't act within 45 days, and HOC and the county don't act within 45 days, within 60 days, then the sale can move forward, and the, the um, property owner and the contract purchaser no longer impede. Is it parallel 60 days? Is yes. it the same 60 days? It's yes. not. It's, and, yeah, it's you're right. It's concurrent. Yeah, and technically the county has the first bite at the apple priority, but in practice we've deferred to HOC if they have expressed interest. Um, and plan on continuing to do that. Now, that said, under the current amendment, this the, the current amendment as proposed would um, have the county only have 10 business days to register a non-binding statement of interest or no interest. And what that effectively means is that we could say within 10 days, no, we're not interested in pursuing your property because, but because it's non-binding, we would be able to one or two or 10 or 20 days later say, no, we changed our mind and we're actually going to move forward. That said, the 10 days does not apply to HOC or to the tenants. And so as far as I understand the practical intent of the amendment, was to give some type of certainty to a property owner if the county was not going to pursue the purchase that they could move forward instead of waiting 60 days that they could just move forward with the sale sooner. That said, as worded, because it's non-binding on the county, no title insurer would let the property owner move forward with the sale right. knowing we could go back on what we said. Or that HSC could come in. Right. And since the um, notice would not be by, not, would, would not, HOC does not have to comply with the 10 day notice, they still have to wait 60 days for HOC. And so um, 
from the landlord's point of view, I don't think there's a practical benefit to them given those issues. And I'll let uh, HO, I'll let uh, Mr. Silverman, uh, sorry, <laughs> but I want to Ken speak. Is fine. What? Ken is fine. Yeah, Ken is fine. <laughs> um, uh, speak for themselves as to what, how, what their opinion would be. I've already stated, uh, for the record, in, in, the count, in the PHP sessions, that I think 10 days would be, um, uh, you know, uh, taxing for us, especially mm -hmm. for larger buildings, um, and given all the other things we have our multifamily team doing, underwriting other loans and closings and things like that. Um, but I'll let uh, Ken uh, speak to whether HOC feels that 10 days would be adequate for them. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really glad to be uh, here with you. Uh, I'm Ken Silverman, for the record, Vice President of Government Affairs for HOC. Um, I, I think we agree that it would be very difficult to make an assessment of a property, uh, particularly a large property, uh, within 10 days, you know, we are, I think, at HOC, potentially even less equipped to move on the volume of properties uh, than DHCA is uh, in terms of, you know, being able to make that evaluation. Um, so I think, you know, that would be very difficult uh, for us to do. Of course, you know, we would seek to comply with however the, the council, uh, you know, wants to structure the, the law, but from a, a, you know, just a pure staffing perspective, uh, it is a tremendous amount of work to analyze that and and even after 60 days uh, you know it's, you haven't been able to do the level of due diligence that you might have if you were you know buying a property uh, you know not under this sort of time constraint and so uh, you still don't you know quite have all the information that you uh, might want to have and and are going in uh, you know a little bit on on hope so um, I think uh, anything that that sort of shortens that timeline, uh, would definitely make it more difficult for us to uh, be able to, uh, you know, consider properties and, and exercise um, the ROFR where appropriate. Um, we do ha have, I think, uh, have, have developed a, a really good working relationship with, with DHCA uh, here, and, and um, so we do work with them to, uh, you know, make a quick decision about uh, whether HOC is going to be involved. Um, and I, I would highlight, I think there was a recent uh, ROFR that um, DHCA undertook that, that did take, you know, basically right up until the, under the gun to be able to, to make that decision. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, if there had to be a decision in 10 days, uh, you know, probably would not have purchased that. Property. If I could just say, this is like Charlie Brown and the football. I mean, you could say that you don't want it, but then you can come back and say that you do. I, I don't see what they, how this is actually helping the organization that's trying to sell this property. I mean, we're trying to keep property. I don't know how your how your financing works, but is your financing able to do things in ten days? No, no it's the so um, we would take on the contract and put down the deposit. Uh, you know, usually one to five percent okay. within sixty days. But then we have um, an additional 120 days to close, and so the the closing can uh, can be tight sometimes. Uh, given the com complex financial stacks, you have to have many different sources, not just one big loan. Um, but yeah, uh, the the financing would be extremely difficult unless we unless you know we had the money of a you know a, a private equity investor or hedge fund and they had all cash. It's uh, it, we, it's not possible to put together the financing within 60 days. Yeah, I, 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 after hearing this, I don't believe 10 days works. I really don't. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor Mink. Thank you. I appreciate the conversation uh, and appreciate the the impetus behind the amendment. Um, but I, you know, I'm seeing kind of two options here like if we if it was to be binding then it would indeed allow that certainty that we would want for the landlords but 10 days is not enough time to come up with a responsible binding decision um 60 days is is a tough timeline for that is what i'm hearing so having uh, creating a binding deadline before the 60 days it sounds like is does not 
both of anyone. Um, if it's non-binding, though, then it doesn't actually provide the certainty that we want to provide. Um, and in fact, it sounds like potentially sets us up to, you know, if we if we then come in after that and submit a you know make moves, um, or after not submitting a letter of interest, or if we submit a letter of interest and then continue the due diligence and don't move forward, that's really not a good look for us. Um, and we don't want to be losing trust uh, amongst the partners that we're working with in this space. So whether it's binding or non-binding, I'm not seeing uh, a compelling case for creating this kind of additional deadline prior to the 60 days. Um, so I, I mean, with that, I, I would second, I think did, I think, did Councilmember Jawanda make a motion to basically go back to the version prior to the amendment? Yeah, if I did. He moved to get rid of this. Oh, what's that? You could move it again and he can second it. I mean, it wasn't seconded. If you oh, okay. want to move it and he can second it if you'd like. Okay. Or can I d defer so he can move if it went since he, I don't want to. You know. Yeah, I mean, I, I did move it there. I didn't okay. hear an ask for a second by the okay, chair. Sorry. Okay. So, <laughs> I looked around. I, okay. You're not in the room. I okay. looked around to see if there was a second. There wasn't. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I was. I wanted I mean, to. I imagine we're going to yeah. debate this yeah. topic. There's. Right. Right. There's six other people in the queue, so you can move okay, it, right. and we can debate it in the context of yeah. that amendment, or we could continue the discussion and then decide, you know, whether or not there's a motion from the floor Sounds subsequent good. to the discussion. Yeah, the information that I was waiting on is what we just heard. So if. Councilor Rajana wants to move it again. Um, you can move or, or it. Okay, or I'll, I'll move it. Yeah, sure. Second. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> but I but I, I look forward to hearing from colleagues as we continue to discuss. And if there's you know compelling cases to to the contrary, then um, happy to go back and reevaluate. Thanks. Okay. So you moved, and Councilmember Jawando seconded. So there is a motion on the floor, but we have people still in the queue on this particular topic. So we'll continue to debate. I think the, the motion is to remove the 10-day notice requirement yeah. to strike that, the committee recommendation that was two to nothing to strike that from the bill. Is that accurate? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see nods from the mover and the seconder and then the seconder and the mover. Um, I, let me turn it to uh, Councilmember Lukey. Well, nothing says good times like following all of that. Um, all right, so so here's where I am with some questions, or to clarify, I I get why there's the 10 day provision. I also think it should be non-binding, but that the reason it should exist within there is because it starts the clock ticking on action of some kind. However, the way it's currently written, there's not a consequence if you don't send a notice during that time, right? So 10 days isn't long enough to know how, you know, whether you're really going to move forward or not. But if you're a definite no, then you don't send anything. If you're a maybe or a yes, you're going to send the, you know, make an initial evaluation of whether, and you're going to, you're going you're gonna to have to cross the T's and dot the I's on that. Then, then you've got the 60 days to figure out collectively the next phase of it. But that there should be something there at the beginning, and I, I do believe it should be non-binding for the 10-day provision only, right, just to get the whole process kicked off, re recognizing and respecting that there's a concurrent right for HOC. Um, but then there has to be something that, you know, if you, if you don't do it, if the county doesn't take action of any kind, that they can't just come back whenever and go, it's me, it's my turn. There has to be a, a finality to it, and so that if you don't trigger an intent by that initial 10-day non-binding provision by giving the appropriate notice, you've waived it. And right now, there's no waiver language in here. There's nothing that says, and there's nothing that, which I think is part of how we had so much confusion of, well, when does it, when does that clock ever stop ticking if you are able to come back at some other time? And so. Um, I don't know how to not complicate things further by asking, <laughs> yeah, good luck, good luck, Don. Um, by asking that there be additional language added to four that clarifies that if the county has not provided that notice of intent, then it waives its right. 
So. Is that another motion on the floor? I just want to make sure, or is that you? Well, here's the thing. I believe, technically, that when a motion is pending, a second motion, it could be a friendly amendment, which in this case it wouldn't be because there are two divergent issues, and that you can't have a second motion pending while the first one is still unresolved. Am I correct? Yeah, unless you're amending the amendment. Right, which I'm not amending the amendment because that would make it a whole new thing, and we don't want to do that, right? That's that's, We would lose people on, on, on the logic of that. So. Um, okay, well, we have a number of people still in the queue, so I think we have to, hmm? we have to yes. hold on your, you can note. Pin, pause. Note the fact that you intend to move yes. something, but we're Thank going you. to continue with the debate and discussion on these uh, on these issues, and we can come back to you to make a, an additional motion. Thank you. Um, our next yeah, is yeah. Uh, Vice President Stewart. Sorry, I messed up all my buttons. Um, <laughs> um, thank you. All right, so I'm going to speak to the motion that we have before us, which is to strike um, and I guess reject the uh, PHP's recommendation to add the uh, 10 days um, notice. Um, I want to thank Councilmember Katz for his line of questioning and his analogy of Charlie Brown with the football because I always appreciate um, having a visual um, to think about these things. Um, and I really do appreciate all the hard work of uh, the staff and the PHP committee um, having worked with Rofers and, and done them there. They are, I think, an excellent tool in our toolbox um, moving forward and doing this to uh, ensure affordable housing in our community. But they can be complicated, um, and particularly when we have tenants who are um, availing themselves uh, of this, it can the the time can go by very quickly. Um, and so, um, I think it is best that uh, we not try uh, and amend our law like this. We keep it as it is on the books. I appreciate representatives, you know, Director um, Bruton here and H Ken from HOC here, um, who probably have more experience than most folks uh, working with these. Um, and so I, I think at this point, we should not try and put this in place because having three different entities that are able to avail themselves of um, this right, uh, I think it just adds confusion to have one of those entities have to enter in a non-binding notice when we have two others. And I don't see how um, and would be very much against um, putting any more restrictions on tenants um, who have to do this because I think it would make it even more onerous on them. Um, so I will support the motion that is before us. Okay, Councilmember Balcom. Um, thank you. Uh, so I just want to start with very few rofers are exercised. So we're looking at one or two, possibly three a year. The flip side of that is that uh, properties come up all, on average once a week, right? So the time that it takes for, um, I, I, it resonates with me for both um, uh, the county and HOC to say we, we, it's a staffing issue to turn this around in a 10-day time. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, perhaps 10 days isn't the right number in terms of a letter of interest. Um, but when we look at the balance, and um, Councilmember Balk, um, Balka, Councilmember Glass, um, it's so confusing, I don't even know my own name. Um, now, Councilmember Glass talked about the balance, right? So um, the issue is we don't, we want to be fair to the, the owner who's trying to sell this property. But we also want to try to get uh, as much housing into affordable housing as we can. So I, I appreciate that balance. So I, qu questions first. Um, so um, the total amount of time is 180 days uh, possible. So do we know what the average amount of time is that, that, first off, 60 days to put down a deposit. Do we know on average how long it takes for the county or HOC to actually put down a deposit? 
Um, we usually put it, uh, based on my knowledge, uh, and I've only been here a year, but uh, my understanding is we usually uh, have done enough due diligence information that within a week or so before the 60 days, we've transferred the deposit and officially signed off on taking over the contract. Okay. And then, and then on average, how long does it take to close? If you have 180 days to close, on average, how long does it take to close? Um, I always, when I used to work on Tenant Opportunity Purchase Act in DC, I always told folks that each deal is unique in and of itself um, because you can find all kinds of complexities. Um, you can find that there is um, an oil tank buried beneath something that requires all kinds of mm -hmm. um, environmental remediation and things like that. And the various different lenders are, in addition to the county, are all going to want to know that all of those things have been discovered mm -hmm. and because they're risk averse, um, as they should be. And so if things are very simple and there are no problems and it's not a big building, then uh, we wouldn't need probably the 180 days. But even a, a, a not big building, uh, you know, something under 50 units could have all kinds mm -hmm. of levels of sure. complexity to it. And it's it's why if the council follows our quarterly reports, there are projects that are scheduled to close and then get pushed out for a year because and that's the private sector working sure. on its own because they've discovered something that pushes them back. And uh, it's, it's very difficult to set rigid deadlines um, because things often go askew. And so for the one, for the properties that either of you choose to not move forward with, um, most of them, the vast majority of them, you choose not to move forward with. Um, are there, do you, do you, are there any that you know right away that you're not going to move forward with? Like, is there a decision tree where you see a, a property comes up and you're like, we're not going forward with that? <laughs> um, I, I don't know that there, there's not a decision tree or a formula um, for at least for HOC. Okay. Um, I think there certainly is a you know a sense of from our commission of you know what we're looking for in terms of you know affordable housing that is or, you know, natural affordable housing that is at risk of losing affordability. Um, so, you know, that helps to guide. So certainly, you know, newer properties, mm -hmm. we would tend not to look closely at, um, you know, older properties, uh, you know, particularly in, uh, areas of the county that have seen a lot of rent growth, uh, you know, we would look the most closely at. Okay. I, I would, I would add that we start off with the basics. Uh, you know, just a, a market, you know, some market research on the property, looking at the due diligence information on expenses and, and um, uh, uh, revenue. Um, but then as we're looking at those things and as other entities in the county become aware of them, then uh, council members sometimes get in touch with us and we'll say, this property is very important to preserving affordability or a particular uh, uh, ethnic community um, in, in their district or, you know, if you're at large, you know, like in general, uh, sometimes the county executive will realize something. Other times we'll have advocacy organizations bring something to our um, attention, such as um, that uh, resettlement groups that bring refugees into the county we will find out sometimes, and this is not usually included in the due diligence information, that there may be a contract that they have for many units at a property mm -hmm. and that the property is worth preserving to try to preserve that, you know, uh, place that is affordable enough and that has a relationship with immigrant communities. Um, and so we often find that there is just, you, you never know what's going to come to you and mm -hmm. who's going to be interested. 
And so it's never just a matter of getting effectively the broker's packet and, and looking at it as it would be if you were, say, uh, you know, a developer out there okay. looking to increase your portfolio. Could, could I perhaps just mm -hmm. suggest, Ms. McCartney Green, we talked quite a bit in committee about Prince George's County that does have a fairly specific decision tree that they use that is what really was the impetus behind the provision that was suggested, actually, by mm -hmm. council staff to address the issue that was raised that was ultimately adopted by the committee. Do you want to if, if, if Councilmember Balcom would like, I mean, maybe Ms. McCartney Green. Well, can I guess that my 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 point would be that um, because there are there are so few um, rofers exercised um, compared to properties that come on the market, um, if there is a way that that uh, we can um, streamline the no. I understand that the yes may take a very long time because of the due diligence, but if you know that if you know that there's a no, if 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 you could convey that to the property owner more quickly, that seems like a a, a good thing to do. I would say that we can work toward you know I, I can instruct my staff uh, to work more diligently on doing that if they see something that's a no I mean even 10 days would be difficult to get the because sure. council members sometimes don't know that that something has been it is up for sale you know for 10 days within the 10 day timeline I will say that you're absolutely right that our that it's generally been one to four that we've exercised over since 2015. That's right. what I have data for. Uh, I will say that two things have changed. One, that the county, thanks to you all and the county executive, uh, that you all have put much more uh, money toward the preservation and creation of affordable housing over the past several years. And so that changes the dynamic. Um, also, the the impetus uh, uh, for uh, what Council, Council President uh, Friedson was trying to achieve for several years in getting us to be able to assign uh, this will free us up in order to, we don't have to hoard you know a hundred million dollars to be able to exercise on something because we're able to assign we'll be able to exercise more often um, and to go to Council President Friedson's comment about the comparison with Prince George's County they have about a tenth of the money that we do. I mean, they're, they're, they just redid their, their row for law and they're expanding. So no knock on them. They're, they're moving more aggressively to do something about it. But currently they have about a tenth of the money. Okay. And so their criteria for evaluating what they'll exercise on is much more narrow because given that money and that sometimes they split it up between multiple properties, they're, they have a much narrower um, type of building that mm -hmm. they can effectively exercise on than what we can uh, act to preserve in, uh, in Montgomery County. Okay, and then um, uh, just I just want to know a little bit more about the tenant uh, um, registration. So, tenant tenants have to register an entity, I guess is. is to, a purchasing entity within they have four to, or five days? They have to register a tenants association. A tenants association, okay. Um, then is there any is there any quantitative, qualitative analysis of the uh, of whether that tenant association has the capacity to purchase the property? The because of the existing law Tenants aren't able to assign their rights. In other jurisdictions, tenants have the ability to assign their rights. Um, and because of that, tenants have, are, gen, are basically limited to smaller properties, um, and they uh, need a higher portion of county funding. But this is true of co-ops, mm -hmm. generally, what tenants are able to form exercising their rights in Montgomery County are limited equity cooperatives because a condominium regime and buying it as a rental property uh, would require financing that would be more problematic. There, there are impediments to doing that without mm -hmm. the ability to assign, which I can go into if you'd like. So uh, can, can I, I just want to sure. follow the timeline. So 
Um, you have you have 60 days to say yes or no, or to say yes, right? Um, so if I if either of you don't follow through, uh, then does the tenant uh, then the uh, tenant association if if you pass on it, the tenant association has the opportunity to go forward, right? Um, but so they they take the risk they have to establish their tenant association before the end of the 60 days. Mm -hmm. 40, no, the 60 days that they have that you yeah. have, right? So by 45 days they have to so they're taking a chance because they could go through the cost and energy of creating the tenant association and you guys come in and say we're going to take it after all, right? Um, so why the disconnect between the 45 days and the 60 days? Could it just be everyone has 45 days? Um, it, I, I don't know the origin of the 45 and 60. That's been since the law was passed back in 1980, I think, or mm -hmm. 81, something like that. Um, uh, as we both testified earlier, limiting us to 45 would really cut into our, I, I will say, uh, we did, uh, as, uh, Ms. McCartney Green and Council President Friedson mentioned, we did make significant uh, concessions to um, uh, industry stakeholders in providing them more surety about what happens after we commit ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so they have, if this law passes as is, um, as with the amendments that we're, we're currently in there, the, the, the uh, housing providers, they have much more certainty than they did before about we are committing ourselves that unless we are not able to make the financing work that we're that you know our uh deposit is stuck and we're going to lose our however many millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of dollars um and we've also uh, given them that uh they don't have to reissue a, a rofer notice if the price changes um less than 10%. Mm -hmm. And so these are things that come from DC law and were, in our opinion, reasonable. And so they have uh, several other concessions we made uh, to uh, provide something uh, mm -hmm. to the industry that they had been seeking. Um, our difference of opinion is, you know, really just on this, uh, you know, this, this 10 days. Got it. And then for the um, tenant, I'm sorry for taking the time, but the tenant, um, the tenant association, so the 45 days, the tenant association is established. And then they have another 45 days to put down a deposit. So they have a total of 90 days. So the go to go back to the question of who assesses, like, um, is there again a decision tree of some sort to say what is the likelihood that this tenant association has the um, financial um, capacity to purchase the property? So what usually happens with that is, and this is the same in the district or other places where tenants have the right, um, is that they seek an acquisition loan from a um, uh, uh, nonprofit lending uh, institution, um, say uh, like LISC, uh, and they, and it's if LISC deems you know their plan, and they're pretty much always working with an organization such as Mikasa, mm -hmm. which is out of this. This is what the the Leland tenants are who are working with, and so tenants aren't just coming up with this on their own. Just like sure. as no developer is a one person solution, they have whole staff, and so these nonprofit organizations help tenants determine if they have a vi if they can viably purchase the building and maintain it, and it's based on their imprimatur of um, the plan that organizations, CDFIs, such as LISP, will make the loan to them. Mm -hmm. And then if the loan from a CDFI goes through, then the, then the county would consider um, making um, a, a loan to help them take out their, to pay, to pay back. Sure. Their um, their acquisition loan and something for uh, money for rehabilitation. This is what we're doing with the Leland right okay. now. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um, thank you. Okay, Councilmember Albernaz. 
Wow. Um, well, I'll start with some, some, a little bit of good news. Um, so recently, a prospective property owner in Bethesda uh, reached out to me in my office about the interest of partnering with the county, about the possibility of purchasing uh, a unit, uh, an apartment complex that was about to go for sale to be able to keep it affordable. And it looks like we're heading in a, in a positive direction there. Um, so thank you, Director, for, for your work on, on that issue. And I, I get from 30,000 feet, I think, the problem we are trying to solve, um, and I appreciate the very thoughtful questions from my colleagues. Um, I, I'm, I'm feeling very similar uh, to the feeling I felt when we discussed other housing regulations before this body in the last year and that these are incredibly complex issues with very significant consequences for many people involved, and that none of these bills can and should be looked at in isolation because we have added a lot of regulation in this space, which has created confusion, which has led to frustration, which I'm concerned is going to, especially in the short term and hopefully not the long term, stifle some of the very um, some of the goals and ambitions we have, you know, for adding housing in Montgomery County. And I'm worried we're back in that place because I, I appreciate the thoughtful comments and questions. I get why the 10 days was introduced in committee and why it was supported by two of my colleagues, because I do think there needs to be a definitive backstop. I understand and respect that 10 days may not be enough, but What's the sweet spot here? Is it 20? I mean, I, I don't feel comfortable proposing something shooting from the hip from the dais uh, and, and then making a decision based on whatever you respond to right now in the moment. Um, and Ms. McCartney Green did yeoman's work in trying to summarize the seven hour session that we had um, on the last most significant policy decision that this body made um, but subsequently, we learned that there was confusion. Not all the I's were dotted or the T's crossed. And it took a long time to get the APQs out. Uh, and so it, it's, I'm just concerned generally uh, about how we are going about this particular conversation. And, and I'll be candid, if, if we do go to a vote, I'm not sure I'm ready to vote on this today. Uh, I may have to abstain just because I want to feel 100% comfortable in knowing what I'm voting for. So I guess with that as context, um, if 10 days is not enough, and I understand and respect why, but acknowledging the intent of the amendment and trying to provide some transparency and clarity, because what we've heard and what we've been alerted is that there will likely be many more conversions from rental units um, as a result of you know, previous actions of this body. So this is going to become more in play. Um, but I could be wrong about that. But could you please just respond on the, the, if 10 days is not enough, what would be appropriate? Um, I guess uh, I, don't like, I don't like indirect answers, but I'm going to give an indirect answer. Um, if the 10 days applies to only uh, the county and not to HOC and the tenants, then I don't see a practical benefit to the landlord. Because if we pick 10 days or 20 days or 30 days uh, for the county and there's no difference in the timeline for HOC or the tenants, then n nothing has changed as far as the housing provider because they have no additional clarity as to whether or not uh, someone's going to exercise. And I, that for me, uh, that is the, the biggest issue that um, whatever the amount of days is and you know as uh, Mr. Soberman said we will comply with whatever the, whatever the council directs us to do but I always like to think practically you know is a legislative or regulatory change going to bring, uh, amendment going to bring about uh, a real world practical change to how things are done okay um. Ms. McCartney Green, is there any light you can shed on this? And I know we don't have uh, representatives from property owners here, um, but I would be curious as to some feedback maybe that we've received in writing or uh, any other helpful feedback that we've received from property owners here. And I would just tell you what I heard. I haven't obviously 
put forth anything for consideration, but I've heard at least 21 days and I've heard at least 45 days as, as options. Uh, 21 days is kind of similar to Prince George's County with them exercising seven and then the 10, that's closer to that. Um, currently with the 10 days, it's already providing at least a two week um, uh, period because it's actually business days. Um, and then I've also, uh, through public testimony, 45 days, um, as well as, as, as options that I've been aware of. Okay. Um, not prepared to vote on this, uh, but I will yield back to you, uh, Mr. President, because um, I still need a little bit more time to process this, frankly. <laughs> Thank um, you. I appreciate that. So let me just note, uh, we're going to do a hard cutoff at 3.30 uh, on this, so I don't think we're going to be ready to vote today. Um, the um, I'll just note on the conversation of what makes the department different and whether it has any practical change. One of the thought processes that has been you know, identified through the conversations is that the big change here is that the department can assign. That is unique to, to the other two entities. Tenants can assign, HOC can assign. The number of assignees is limitless. The department could, you know, has to create certain standards and we'll see what is created, but there is an, you know, an infinite potential number of entities that could qualify and we've expanded that significantly including adding the municipal partners and so one of the you know kind of shocks to the system is all of the you know not just whether the department is going to exercise not just whether HOC is going to exercise not just whether uh, tenants are going to form an association and ultimately uh, exercise uh, but the department who can assign to what seems like it could be a limitless number and so that was Part of the, the thinking to, you know, notice of, of intent, like, is this something that the department is hearing from, you know, interested parties? Is this something that the department is going to proactively, you know, engage? Is this something that, you know, there's a, a serious uh, pursuit of? So, you know, I don't want to get into a debate. I just wanted to, you know, explain to the point that was uh, raised. That was one of the things that, you know, had come up in, in, in some conversations, although it was not explicitly uh, stated as part of the, the materials uh, for, for, for the meeting. Let me turn it to Council Member Glass, then I have Council Member Fanny Gonzalez in the queue. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate the thoughtful and uh, inquisitive conversation from my, from my colleagues. I want to take a step back a little bit and understand, try to understand the practical effect of any of these timelines, right? A property provides notice or you learn of a property that is about to be on the market or is on the market, and let's just say a 10-day shot clock begins. What do you do? Director Bruton, I'll start with you, and I'll ask the same of HOC. Sure. Um, so what we do is we look at the, the Rofer packet comes with uh, uh, legally required information, uh, as before, you know, uh, costs, revenues, things like that. We look at that. We do. Uh, we pull up an analysis of the zoning, uh, the property's history. Um, we schedule um, a walkthrough of the property, which we're allowed to do by law. Um, sometimes the landlord will not let us in for a while. It took us more than 10 days for a current recent rofer to get them to let us onto the property to even do uh, a walkthrough. And that's normally something you do. Is that against the law? No, there's nothing in there about the timeline for when they need to let us well, in. Well, that seems like it's a separate conundrum. One we won't address now, we'll put a pin on that, but okay. Yes, um, and it, granted, there's, a, there's enough work to be done during that period. Um, and after the walkthrough, um, we are evaluating, because of the current law, we have to purchase the property and hold it, but we still are only holding it. We still effectively assign, but we assign after we've spent a ton of money to hold the property for a few hours. Um, and so we begin talking to um, uh, partners, uh, known good actors in the affordable housing development field. And we talk to multiple uh, because not everybody's going to have the capacity or interest. Um, and they have they may have different development models. And we uh, vet the property with them. Currently, Another thing that this law would fix, we are not allowed to share that rofer packet with them. We have to get a waiver 
from the contract purchaser and the owner even to share the due diligence information with our potential partners. Sometimes the owner will delay that for weeks. Sometimes they will not let us do that, and that can impede our ability. And so um, I will add, uh, to partially answer you and partially answer uh, Council Member Abernaz, um, the original intent of this bill, as Council President Friedson mentioned, was to enable the county to exercise its right by assignment. It's something we can do anyway, but it's taking impediments out of us, I mean, out of our way. And as with any time there is a, that a law is opened up for amendment, interested parties, especially interested parties on the industry side, will come in and try to make as many changes as they can. And so the 10 days is, was originally suggested by industry. Those amendments that we accepted uh, in a friendly manner to deal with their concerns, those were included by industry. The LIHTC exemption, that was included by MHA. And those things are all immaterial to what our original intent was to do. And so we have been spending a significant amount of time talking about an amendment that gets to the actual rover process as compared to what the original intent of the amendment was to do. And I just want to also kind of add in, take the liberty to add in the context that this bill, if you all pass it today, would allow us to use these new um, uh, uh, processes to uh, work on existing rofers, and we have some very ex significant existing rofers right now. Um, if we this bill, I mean, and this was emergency legislation, and it it's been many months. Um, and if we if we delay further on this, and I know the council, you know, has the budget coming up, that um, we will still be under the current regime and will be effectively prevented from sure, exercising. Sure, sure. I, I understand what the practical effects of the status quo are, right? Um, and let me get back to the point that you, you are alluding to about the work that still needs to be done. But let me ask Mr. Silverman, from your perspective, how do you operate, how would you operate uh, with the county within this time frame? Uh, so we, you know, follow a similar process to what Mr. Bruton laid out uh, in terms of evaluating the, you know, financials of the property, uh, the condition of the property, the zoning and the potential. Um, you know, I think we're also looking at, um, you know, how it might interact with our existing portfolio, you know, other factors. We do have, uh, you know, we're, uh, unlike the uh, DHCA, we do have our commission and we, we do have to have discussions with our um, commission, so that does add a little bit of time at times to have, you know, be able to convene board meetings and um, and have those formal discussions uh, before we can make a, a final decision. Um, and uh, I think the sort of informal arrangement that uh, has worked over the years is that, as Mr. Bruton said earlier, um, generally they will look to HOC to give a, an early indication of whether we're interested or not. Um, and then, uh, you know, move to look whether there's other uh, affordable housing providers in the community that might want to uh, take it up. Um, I would offer, you know, we would be very eager and happy to work with DHCA to, you know, see if any way to, to streamline, um, you know, getting the a notice out. I just, you know, from our point of view, at least today, you know, saying any particular time frame that we're comfortable with, you know, a, a shorter than 60 days. Um, you know, it's not not something that we can we can offer. Sure. Thank th thank you for for shedding some light on that, uh, Ms. McCartney Green. With respect to the the uh, hurdles that Director Bruton mentioned, with the time frame, the timeline, with the access, is there anything in this bill that would compel the property owner to provide the uh, the walkthrough as soon as demanded or needed, or uh, provide that paperwork? Uh, so that it can then be shared with a third-party provider or provide a waiver? No, there's no restrictions or timeline that's on that specifically, and so it's at the discretion. Now, each party is obviously in good faith and fair dealing, want to make sure that this transaction can close within a certain time, but other than the allotted time of within 180 days, um, there is, there's not, I'm, I'm specifically looking at, you know, Section 53A4,
instead of just speaking to her. Um, the, uh, there I was going to ask what you said. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there is language uh, in the in the amendment uh, in the original amendments as proposed that would um, all qualified entities, you know, though that selected group that Council President Preetz had mentioned earlier. Um, they would have to sign what is effectively a non-disclosure agreement, but they would automatically be allowed uh, to see the, the rover packet information. And so that issue is taken care of. The um, access to the property in the certain number of days, that is not included. Okay. So we have identified another problem with this and that there's nothing compelling the property owner from moving up a timeline or accommodating the shorter time frame that DHCA would need to operate under. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, so with regard to uh, Director Bruton, the point that you raised earlier about how often this is done, I, I, I believe I saw it in the packet, but I think it's important to share uh, for the sake of this conversation. How many of these were executed in 2023 or 2022? In 2022, we exercised um, one for Scarborough Square uh, in Rockville when we partnered with uh, Rockville Housing Enterprises on that. And the second was um, Westchester West, um, somebody's a big fan of. Um, and uh, we partnered uh, with um, uh, Enterprise Community Development. Um, and in, it, as I mentioned, in both of those cases, we took possession of the property and then uh, within 24 hours uh, sold it back to them. And that was 2022 or 2023? That was that was 2022. Okay. We did not exercise uh, the right of first refusal in 2023. Um, the you'll be getting you'll be getting our 2023 report by the 15th. Okay. Um, and but we did um, we did work with partners and fund um, one two three four five I believe five rover projects. So eyes wide open, this is not the panacea to creating more affordable housing or maintaining affordable housing as only two were acquired in 2022 and none in 2023. I just make sure I heard you correctly. Uh, now I think the flip side to that question is how many uh, agreements were entered into? How many were held onto for the 120 days or so? Uh, zero. Um, because we, we're required to give a certificate of compliance. We don't wait. We, uh, we give a certificate of compliance um, within the 60 days or shortly after the 60 days. And once they receive a certificate of compliance from us, then they can move forward. Um, they are technically allowed to move forward after the 60 days is over, uh, but usually the title insurer uh, would it prefers a certificate of compliance uh, from the county just as a like a stamp that yes you know uh, they, they that the owner of the property uh, abided by all the legal requirements so so going back to councilmember Katz's comparison to Linus uh, to Lucy um, uh, and, and Charlie Brown and, and, and the football it doesn't seem from what you're saying that, that concern has been realized. Is that which concern? Uh, that that there's been a bait and switch. That the county has uh, signaled intent and held on to the property for an extended period of time and then released it. No, oh, which no. is my understanding of what we're tr that this amendment or this change is trying to prohibit. To, to the best of my knowledge, uh, I, my knowledge goes back to about 2015, which we've done the data on, is that we've never done that. Um, that if we get to the 60 days and say we're interested and we put down the deposit, then we move forward. Okay. Um, because we would be conceivably at peril to losing our deposit. And if we, even if we got our deposit back, then um, we take very seriously because it could um, uh, lessen confidence in the process if we were to um, uh, say we were going to exercise and then held the property for a lot longer and then pulled back. Yeah, I mean, as everyone has said, that's damaging to our credibility uh, and the process. And I, 
associate myself with everything everyone said because we're all trying to, to work towards the same goal of retaining and acquiring more affordable housing. The reality is this process in itself over the last two years has only acquired two properties. Uh, and by your testimony, uh, we have never had a bait and switch process, which is uh, the concern that industry has, which is why they've requested this. Is that a correct assessment? Um, yes, we don't. Yes, we haven't. Okay. Uh, we haven't pulled back once we've put yep. down a deposit. Right to continue that that analogy. Um, thank you. I think this is very insightful. Uh, I welcome any additional uh, testimony or information for people who are following this conversation. If in fact there are instances that have uh, uh, harmed the sale of property, the rightful sale of property, uh, I would like to learn about that. Uh, but as of now, I, I have concerns about these parameters. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Fani Gonzalez. Thank you. I am ready to vote on this bill today. I'm just going to put that out there. I read my package, and I know exactly how I'm voting, and I'm hoping there's no delay here. Uh, the reason why I voted for this in PHP is because, you know, it says make an initial, initial evaluation of whether it is interested that doesn't mean that you're going to do it. It means if you're interested. But if this thing, and that's why I was thinking, you know, maybe there's a property um, that is, I don't know, 10 years old, and it was on the market, and we know that we're not going to purchase it, let's send a letter to make sure that the private sector they can, can, can take advantage of this. But if this is creating so much confusion, I'm going to say let's just remove it, buffer it, and continue. Because it shouldn't be this, com it's not this complicated. But it's getting this complicated and in the spirit to move on let's please vote on that amendment and move on thank you okay thank you councilman mink thank you if that was a motion then i would theoretically support it and <laughs> um yeah i don't i don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good here i certainly understand the efforts that that everyone is making um but from what i'm from, from what I'm understanding of this, um, from what I'm hearing, uh, I would be concerned that this would be um, causing more problems, potential problems in practice than it would actually solve. Um, I want to make sure that we have time to do due diligence before we're signaling uh, support so that we don't look like we can't be trusted when we send out those signals. And, um, and I also... Uh, I don't want to sit on this because uh, because of this one piece because I don't think that this is vital to the bill. So I think I, I very much appreciate Councilmember Fani Gonzalez uh, on on that point. But I do think that the bill is incredibly important. That the PHP committee um, with the many partners and stakeholders has done fantastic due diligence uh, on this overall. And right now, by not passing this, we are. Uh, holding up significant funding that could be used for better purposes uh, and we're also there are buildings and opportunities that are entering the pipeline right now so um, I, I, I would I would like to move forward as well thank you thank you Councilman Balcom I just want to be on the record that I did read my packet <laughs> As I think probably everybody here did. Uh, not only did I read my packet, but I watched the um, PHP sessions, both of them. So uh, I think we're all uh, prepared. Um, so just just point two points of clarification. The certificate of compliance, um, so 60 days, um, you issue a certificate of compliance if you're not moving forward. But how does that fit into the Tenants Association? Um, there, they don't issue a certificate of compliance. There's, if if they have not registered uh, a tenants association with DHCA uh, by 45 days, then their rights are done. But if they have issued a, a tenants association, they still have an additional 45 initial, days. So it would be 90 days. Correct. Um, and then, um, okay, just wanted to clarify that. And then the. Um, the issue that Councilmember Mink stated. So, um, how? Excuse my ignorance. It probably wasn't in the packet. Uh -huh. But um, the issue of how is this? You already there's already uh, funding in place and a bill in place 
that it, so Rofer is continuing. So how is this specific bill holding up what you need to do with the current uh, properties under um, assessment? Um, so uh, that's sort of a two-part answer to that. One, uh, under the current law, we have to purchase the building at the full purchase price. Mm -hmm. And so say the building is $100 million, we have to have $100 million that we can put down at a particular okay. time. Got it. I got it. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Council Member Lukey, last person speaking on this, then we're going to vote on this particular amendment and then we'll Then I don't need to speak because it's not about this amendment. Okay. <laughs> we're going to vote, then I'll turn to you. There you you go. can speak to your last item and then we're getting very close to the time that we have allocated for this item. So we have a, a, a motion on the, the, the floor to strike the uh, committee language related to the uh, 10 days uh, and, and the uh, requirement of a notice. All in favor of that proposed amendment, please indicate by raising your hand. I vote all, yes. All opposed. All right, that is seven to three. It, uh, and no, absta no abstention. So it's uh, Albernaz, Balcom, Friedson. Um, okay. We have disposed of that item. All right. Council Member Lukey. All right. So I've been, now I'm scrolling, trying to find it in the packet, which was long. Um, but I had a question about the effective date of the bill. Yeah, that's the next discussion. Great, I'm right on time. Okay, so my question is, um, as originally introduced, it was an expedited emergency bill, which I totally appreciate and totally on board with. Um, this other piece, though, about it being retroactively applied has some legal concerns for me. And so uh, I wanted to know if you could speak to that, particularly if, in fact, between the period of January 1st and the present, there have been, um, other offers or that have encumbered properties that would potentially be subject to this because that creates some liability for the county. So could you speak to that? Yeah, and I want to make sure everyone's on the same page. We're looking at page eight of the staff report, but specifically uh, circle 64, which has the effective date, transition language, and also a sunset clause. And I will say this is a little bit complex, but uh, the intent was this, but you mentioned this bill was an expedited bill that was introduced back in September. We've had nearly almost 20 amendments that were made between now and that time. Um, and so this has slowed the process for uh, the department to be able to use this. And so this was to take into consideration that as of January 1st, any transactions that were um, into or, or engaging or progress or pending, this bill would fall under it. Um, the bill was introduced back last year and so while it, it had provisions that would um, could have been applied at an earlier date, was not. And so this is obviously in the public's best interest. It's trying to lessen the risk of any loss of any units. And so um, it, it's doing a couple of things. The bill's effective as of enactment, but it also has a transition language. And the reason why the transition language is um, important is because in the law itself, if adopted by the council, we talked about the method of regulations to establish a criteria for a qualified entity. Mm -hmm. Passing the bill today just passes the fact that the department can now assign, but without the ability to actually assign it to a qualified entity, it's, it's just putting the, the cart, you know, we're doing one thing and not the other. And so the transition clause uh, was giving the council the opportunity to approve and review the criteria that's set out here and but what it also does and that's going to sun sunset clause is it gives the county executive to approve that qualified entity based on those um, criteria but that would sunset after 90 days of this bill and so I, I will say that this is a little bit different in, in in our approach but it was also preserving and protecting the whole purpose of the bill um, despite the delays in the different amendments that were right adopted yeah, uh, like Noble policy goals aside, though, every bill is not effective until it has been enacted, right? So even if I introduce a bill, I introduced a bill in 2023, right after I came on the council, and then that happened, and, you know, we have a certain deadline for when they finally, 
you know, you either get it over the finish line or you don't, right? But during that time, anything that the bill I introduced would have affected doesn't live in a state of endless limbo waiting for my legislation to pass or not pass. And when you're talking about property rights and other things, like there are some constitutional considerations there. And so I'm not understanding why the language at lines, you know, 184 to 187 exist and specifically state they apply retroactively when things may have occurred, you know, viable property transactions may have been entered into, contracts may have been entered into, and that puts the county in a really weird spot, right? Even though it may serve a policy interest of the county, there are potential liability issues there and lawsuits that I would anticipate would come forth because of a retroactive application. Even in a civil context, we still do have certain constitutional considerations to keep in mind there. And I just don't think that's a place the county needs to be. And Councilor right. Luke, I'm going to let my uh, supervising attorney, uh, Christine Wellens, jump in. But I wanted mm -hmm. to let you know that this was a discussion that had with OCA to, to, to vet and think about language that we felt like would not jeopardize or put the county at, at risk. OK. That was basically what I was going to say. <laughs> no, it's like, no, it's great. Um, but I just wanted to, to add that to Councilmember Luke's point, I mean, and it is a very good point, um, we can, ha in, in general, have retroactive laws when, barring, you know, constitutional considerations, when uh, the legislative body explicitly says we want this to be retroactive. The default, of course, is that it's perspective. I think in terms of the constitutional issues, I assume the main one would be the contracts clause, um, which you know we had evaluated and also spoke with the county attorney's office and did not think that was an impediment to the transition clause. I think if we want to get probably more into the weeds in it, if necessary, that you know probably we should do that in the context of you know confidential advice to the council yes. or you know potentially a closed session if you need if we need to you know further about this right I don't I don't have any problem with us voting and passing this as effective immediately yes I do have problems and concerns legally about making it retroactive in this context and would respectfully request that we receive additional advice on that beyond the contracts clause because it is a a bit of a hornet's nest of different provisions in there that affect um, retroactivity, both in, I mean, obviously in the criminal context in certain ways, but in the civil context as well. So are you making a motion to well, I mean, I mean, see, there's two aspects of this. Just, my, to be, just yes. to, I just want to clarify, there's two aspects of this. One is whether or not assignment can happen before regulations are promulgated, because the the manner in which the assignments can occur, the entities to which uh, they can occur, are established under Method 2 regulations, which have not been adopted by this body. Right. And until they're adopted by this body, there is, we can allow for assignment to happen, but to uh, Ms. McCartney-Green's point, there. Yeah, you can make the reservation. You can't hold the reservation. There's no one to receive right. the the, right. the you know. There's no qualified entity to obtain on the other end because we haven't defined under regulation, you know, what those qualified entities you know can be and what the process to determine, you know, what they what they are. Right. The, the the second piece of it is whether or not prior to today, any transaction from a certain date to today or to the ultimate passage of this right. legislation would, would be allowed. Yes, my, those, those my, are two different, yes are, I understand that. My related. issue is not with understand. Section 3 transition. Right, right. My issue is with Section 2 effective date and yep. having a retroactive application. So I hear everyone on the Section 3 transition and the need to not have a purgatory kind of thing happening, right? Got, got that. But for things that have already happened, that presents a distinct legal consideration. And so my only concern is with Section 2 and the effective date and wanting to not make it retroactive. Okay. Do you want to make a motion? Yes. I'd move to um, remove the language that in lines 184 um, and 185 that states that, that it would apply retroactively to any 
right of first refusal offer of sale received by the county after January 1st, 2024. So that this will only apply prospectively from the day we pass the legislation forward. There is a motion on the floor. There is a second by Councilmember Albernaz. Uh, is there any debate on this or someone in the queue? But I think from a prior discussion, uh, I don't see any discussion on this item. So we'll turn to staff for your Director Bruden. Yeah. views. Director Bruden, do you want to chime in on this? Um, your housing expert, non-legal expert opinion? <laughs> I would say I'm not a lawyer, so I cannot comment on those issues. I have to defer to the council attorneys as well as, the, as OCA. Um, and I generally found them to, you know, have, have good legal knowledge uh, with no disrespect to your legal knowledge. Um, the um, uh, speaking as a non-lawyer, um, I don't see an impact on the owner because it could still be purchased um, and it's still our rights. It would just and it would still end up in the same entity's hands. Um, it's just that the process would be slightly different. They're, the purchase price they're getting, the terms of their contract are no different, so there'd be no kind of tortious interference um, uh, with that. And so, again, non-lawyer, but I'd be curious to know what specific cause um, a, a property owner could, could bring suit could I just clarify? So my understanding, based on the committee's discussion, the intent of the committee, and I don't want to, I, I just, please correct me if I don't get this right, but <laughs> I have full, and question whether or not colleagues have read the packet, which we have. Um, the intent here was specifically and exclusively on the assignment, that the assignment would be able to happen at the effective date. So the way I have always interpreted that is that we are allowing for assignment to occur prospectively. But if you are within the window, like if this is passed today and it's within the 60 day window and there's still enough time for an assignment to occur under the, you know, uncodified language that we have, you know, established of, of you know, the additional assignment abilities that for the 90 day period, when it would expire, which gives you time to essentially put four regs, method two regs, we would allow for assignment to occur. So that there's not a point in time where we pass the law, but where the department does not, does not have the ability to do assignment. So I don't, to, to, I think to Director Bruton's point, it sounds like from your comments, you had this similar. Yeah, I, mean, I think you make that, that I, a, yeah. an excellent point that this would not be for an expired, you know, like our expired 60 days. Right. The In order to exercise this, we would still have to be inside our 60-day window. Um, and so uh, something would have had to, like, say you all vote on this today and we're able to move. Uh, a ROFR notice would have had to be issued within the past 60 days for us right. to do this. And so we would still be within our. Yeah. If it's you know, 61, if, if today is the 61st day after, then no assignment could occur no. because the bill would not have been in effect, assuming we you know, vote on it today. The, the time will have lapsed. The county will have failed to exercise its rights and its responsibilities under the provisions of either the existing ROFR law or the amended ROFR law. The question is if we're in day 21, 22, or something of that nature, can an assignment take place or in order for the department to exercise ROFR, does it have to come up with the cash? And that's the, the question. The idea was to create a transition to allow for prior to regs being promulgated after the effective date of the bill, do you allow for an assignment to take place within the existing ROFR timeline? To, to me, that that was what we talked about in committee. That's what there was an interest in. The question was, if there is an existing ROFR situation, are we able to assign it or are we forbidden from assigning it until we promulgate regs? And the idea was we can do a transition in order to address that specific window. 
So just just want to clarify. So there's nothing in Section 2 that would give the county a new right that it does not already have. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. All right. Just FYI, I don't like retroactive statutes, but I think you all guessed that already. Yeah. I'll be better at drafting that. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just, you know, it's, it's, it creates consternation where there may not need to be any. It's been helpful to have this conversation that makes it clear that you are not giving, you know, giving us essentially the county a right that we didn't already have and trying to take that retroactively because that's, that's where I had the problem. Um, so to the extent that there are, you know, there's no property that would be adversely affected by the application of that section, then I would withdraw the motion. If you're representing here today that there are no properties that would be adversely affected wherein the county would gain a new right that it does not already have by retroactive application to January 1st. Other than the right to assign, right? That's but but that's a right right the yeah. right to assign we're giving it but 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 that the county could still take action of some kind is still viable yes it's, right okay thank you i'll withdraw the motion then okay thank you option to assign its right of first refusal to qualified entity must not extend the 60-day period or the 100 day, 180 day period so the existing would would remain yes. okay all right so that's been withdrawn i have Councilmember Mink in the queue. Um, with appreciation to the PHP committee uh, and the council attorneys, I would move to end debate and vote. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Before we get to that, any other items from council staff? Outstanding no, I'm, issues? I'm finished. That's it. <laughs> okay, I don't see anybody here uh, interested in furthering this conversation. Uh, so, uh, we have a motion on the floor. There's no debate. We will move to a roll call vote. Councilmember Lukey? Yes. Councilmember Lukey votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Councilmember Sales is absent. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Albernos? Yes. Councilmember Albernos votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Friesen? Yes. Councilmember Friesen votes yes. And that item passes a 10 to nothing as amended. Thank you for the robust discussion. Thank you to Director Bruton and to Ms. McCartney Green and Ms. Wellens for uh, your uh, hard work and advice and feedback on that. The next item on our agenda is item 14, a resolution to appoint the council's nominees to the Advisory Commission on Policing. Uh, we have uh, 10 individuals who are before the, the body who have been nominated by colleagues. I'll note that the county executive has submitted his uh, nominees uh, for these items. We are going to be scheduled to take that up on March 5th. Uh, we didn't want to wait uh, for uh, his to come forward for us to move forward with uh, ours to be respectful of those uh, dedicated individuals in our community who put themselves forward. We wanted to give them uh, the ability to know what was what was happening so that they could uh, move forward, but we will take up the county executive's uh, uh, nominees uh, on uh, March the 5th. Uh, included in the packet for transparency is the name of the council member uh, and the individual uh, uh, who they are nominating. Uh, and uh, with uh, that, um, I can actually uh, note if people are interested, Eva Quitman uh, for the youth position, Petros Bain uh, for the young adult position, um, and we'll take that up on, on uh, March the 5th. Um, 
Unless there are any comments on this, is there a motion to approve the resolution? I have a motion from uh, Council Member Katz, Chair of the Public Safety Committee, a second by Council Member Balcom to appoint the Council's nominees to the Advisory Commission on Policing. Uh, all in favor, please indicate by raising your hand. That is unanimous yes. by all those present and virtual uh, 10 to nothing. Uh, congratulations and thank you to our newly appointed members, 10 of the newly appointed members of the Advisory Commission on Policing. Uh, the council certainly appreciates your service and looks forward uh, to your uh, recommendations to uh, us uh, as a body. The council will now sit as the district council to take action on two zoning text amendments. The first is uh, item uh, 15. Uh, this is action on zoning text amendment 2311, regulatory approvals, conditional use. The, plowsing, the, 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 the planning, housing, and parks committee recommends uh, enactment with uh, in, in amendment. Um, I'll just note um, that uh, ZTA 2311 is an effort to streamline processes to support a variety of local businesses, including home-based businesses focused on child care and health and wellness. In order to facilitate the private sector investment, we need to support our shared priorities. We have to be strategic and intentional, break away from the same old approaches that lead to the same old results. This is a common sense reform that will streamline some of our bureaucratic processes, help cut bureaucratic red tape, and support a variety of local businesses, including home-based childcare, retail and service establishments, and home health practitioners. This was an effort, as colleagues are aware, where we worked very closely with the uh, hearing examiner and the planning department collaboratively with Ms. Nadu uh, and my office uh, to come up with common sense changes to our approval processes to make it just a little bit easier to start a business in Montgomery County. Uh, it's part of a broader effort uh, and a continued effort to cut bureaucratic red tape and reduce regulatory burdens that this council has been very much focused on. Uh, some of those include ZTA 2109, uh, which I introduced to review processes for priority biohealth facilities, ZTA 2202, which streamlined the processes to help biohealth facilities build and expand in urban areas, uh, and most recently ZTA 2302 that uh, I introduced along with Council Member Sales to significantly reduce the time it takes to produce new mixed income housing communities. We're also going to take up right after this. Uh, 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 SRA 2302, which will allow concurrent review of a preliminary plan and conditional use uh, application. And essentially, this just cuts some unnecessary steps. It better synchronizes the hearing examiner uh, and the planning department, and it just makes the process uh, a little bit easier to move forward with certain business types uh, in our community. I want to thank all of the stakeholders who weighed in on this. This uh, is hopefully going to be a relatively quick discussion today, uh, if at all, but took literally over a year of conversations uh, internally, so it doesn't reflect the amount of work. I want to thank Cindy Gibson uh, on, on my team and, and, and Ms. Nadu in particular, along with planning and uh, the hearing examiner I see has uh, just uh, uh, walked in and uh, director of OZA, uh, which we really uh, appreciate uh, her, her leadership. Um, ben Berber uh, as well from, from planning. So thank you to everybody. Thank you for all the work. Uh, it, uh, cutting red tape takes a lot of red tape <laughs> to cut. So I'll just uh, note that. Let me turn it to Miss Nidu if you have anything to add. Um, I have nothing to add other, th other than the committee did recommend this with some amendments. Um, they're mostly clarifying and technical amendments listed on page 14 of the staff report. So I won't read them to you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> We have, uh, <laughs> since uh, Councilmember Balcom notes that uh, we have all read them in our packets and they are there for public consumption, uh, we have a uh, committee recommendation. I don't see anybody uh, here signed up uh, to, to speak, so um, this is a roll call vote, so I'll ask Madam Clerk to please call the roll. Councilmember Lukey? Yes. Councilmember Lukey votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Councilmember Sales is absent. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. 
Councilmember Katzfoots, yes. Councilmember Albanos? Yes. Councilmember Albanos votes yes. Councilmember Fani Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fani Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Friesen? Yes. Councilmember Friesen votes yes. Okay, that is approved. Ten to nothing. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, Thank you, colleagues. The next item is the second item for the council sitting as the district council to take up subdivision regulation amendment, SRA 2302, preliminary plan approval procedures. Uh, this is the accompanying SRA to the uh, ZTA that we just approved. The Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee recon recommends enactment. I don't believe council staff has anything to add. Neither do I, to everybody's delight. Uh, so uh, with that, I don't see anybody interested in speaking on this measure. Uh, I will ask the clerk to please read the roll. Call the roll. Councilmember Lukey? Yes. Councilmember Lukey votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Councilmember Sales is absent. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Albanos? Yes. Councilmember Albanos votes yes. Councilmember Fani Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fani Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Friesen? Yes. Councilmember Friesen votes yes. Thank you. That is approved. Ten to nothing. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you to uh, to everybody involved in moving those two items forward. It will be a, a positive step forward, make it a little bit easier to do business in Montgomery County, which we always appreciate. We're gonna move on to our last item on today's agenda, item 16, the consent calendar. I just wanted to quickly note Dr. Nina Ashford, who is being uh, 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 nominated and uh, approved for Chief of Public Health Services, Department of Health and Human Services. I just wanted to, to note and thank her for her willingness to serve and for her coming before this body and answering uh, a lot of questions uh, in a robust discussion that we had and uh, just a nod to her and a nod to our uh, entire uh, uh, HHS team and public health team um, and uh, really appreciate all of the efforts that are needed uh, now as much as ever. So uh, with that, uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Lukey, second by Councilmember Albernaz. All in favor, please raise your hand. That yes. is unanimous by those present and virtual. Approved 10 to nothing. Uh, and with that, colleagues, we are adjourned. <laughs> We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions change, this station is updated with up-to-date transportation information to aid you in your daily commute. You are listening.